Hello again, friends, and you are our friends, and welcome back to another edition of Jim Cornette's drive Through, right here, wherever it is that you have pulled up to on this, I guess, Wednesday this week that we're debuting. I am the great Brian Last. I'll be answering, I'll be answering, I'll be asking your questions, and the man answering them, the Oklahoma kid, Jim Cornette. <laughs> I'm going to tell, just for that, I'm going to tell what we were talking about a second ago. <laughs> Last month, I got sick, I got the flu, and then you got the flu, and now I was about to tell you, uh, right before, and I see, hear the pain in my voice as I move, I was about to tell you, before we went on the air, that my back has been hurting me since this halfway cross-country trip to Oklahoma and back, and you, totally independently, without no, any foreknowledge whatsoever, we'd never met before, uh, you said, my back's been out. And I said, well, well, fuck, we're like two old women that live together. And our cycles have synced up. If I get something, you get something or whatever. I'm starting to worry about it. Are you all right in any other way, every other way? Do you have any other ill health that I should watch out that might be coming my way? Well, for the record, uh, usually you get it first and then I get it. But in case it goes the other way, I do have a little bit of a sore throat today. Oh, thanks. Well... Hopefully, you know, I'm a trendsetter anyway. You copy me. <laughs> so maybe we'll, it, it goes in that direction. It won't bounce back. That's right. Uh, speaking of bouncing back, we are bouncing back on our schedule from I appreciate everybody's patience. I did make the pilgrimage to Oklahoma and back in, in near record time last week, but it still delayed us, what, 48 hours for programming like this of this quality. Sometimes if you got to wait a little bit, but. I do appreciate everybody giving us the patience, and, and I, I know we got fans in Oklahoma, the old Mid-South Territory, Oklahoma City, Tulsa, Lawton was a big town, um, and so I don't mean for them to take this wrong, but Oklahoma scares the shit out of me. This part of Oklahoma, it's, it's, it's rural, rural, rural Oklahoma. Uh, say that three times fast. I can't even say it at all, so you'd be <laughs> doing better than me anyway. But And you can't go 10 feet without hitting a Trump sign, a church, or a flag, and that makes me very nervous. But I see now how there are, there are the same number of senators that get the same amount of votes in the United States Senate from California with 33 million people as from Arkansas with 3 million people and Montana with 17 and a half people, one woman's pregnant. So I now know how that many of us are in this situation. Let's just put it that way. Anyway, um, for all you no good fuckers who have sent me money, I said that just for you, Brian, you popped on it last well in the experience. What I said, if, if you people have sent me money in the last week, well, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> but no, for all you people who have sent me money at jimcornet.com, I've sent you merchandise. We are, uh, we're very well caught up. As a matter of fact, as, as you hear this, the final orders through Monday morning will already be winging their way through the postal system to you. You know, it occurred to me for the for the new folks, the new listeners out there, I never really sell my stuff anymore or advertise it. I just cuss the people that have sent me money and tell them their shit's on the way because we're shipping shit as fastly as, as fastly, as swiftly as, or as fastly as shit can be shipped. <laughs> but I don't ever actually tell them what we're selling. You can go to jimcornette.com and there's pretty banners in color and everything that advertise a lot of it, or you can click on collectibles and work your way down through, but the best selling graphic novel behind the curtain, my action figure from figures, toy company, not only Jim Cornette stuff, but classic wrestling, the wrestling gold 10 hour DVD set for $9 autographed is still available. I'm violated. Every time somebody purchases one of those, I lose money on these, but I'm, I'm, I'm keeping the prices down, and I'm going for volume, folks. So jimcornette.com, you can order now, and for the next week or so, nothing will be delaying me from shipping your shit out as, as swiftly as shit can be shipped. Fastly. Fastly, or fastly. The only thing that's going to delay me this week, now come to think of it, is my two, count them two, different personal appearances in the same month. That will not happen again this year, folks. 
Uh, uh, March 14th, we're going to be in Circleville, Ohio, opening up the new Heritage Center at the fairgrounds for Bobby Fulton and World Classic Professional Big Time Wrestling with the Fan Fest all day. And the wrestling event, that's the only place I will be this year where wrestling is actually taking place. So that way I can get my fifth decade, 80s, 90s, O's, teens, and now 20s as a professional. And I trust Bobby Fulton not to book the Invisible Man, but he has booked tons of celebrities and legends for the Fan Fest. So uh, anyway, just look that up. Go to jimcornett.com, click on appearances, look it up. And LexCon, March 27th through the 29th in Lexington, Kentucky. A bunch of folks are coming to that. Every year they do all over, not, not only from all over the country, but especially from the old Smoky Mountain Territory and the old Memphis Territory and the old Ohio Territory, the old West Virginia Territory. It's going to be a meeting of people from old fucking territories at LexCon. And I've got all kinds of stuff I'm bringing and I'm going to buy even more to take back with me. Uh, and then I'm done in public for a while till the summer in Charlotte. Anyway, you know, we've had this controversy going on the past few weeks on the program, Brian. I don't mean to just take over this thing like it's my show or anything and lead the conversation, but I, I want to once again confront you about some of the controversial statements you've been making Me? A, a, about, about pizza and hot dogs. Oh, come on. And and it's been it, it it Twitter has blown up about it, and people are are weighing in with their opinions, massively weighted in my favor. I should add on both the pizza and the hot dog situation. I wouldn't say that's true. Did you see somebody tweeted the clip from the Abbott and Costello routine, which is where I actually got part of what I said. I saw that when I was fucking nine on WDRB Fox 41 here in Louisville. It wasn't Fox then. There was no Fox. But a a a Abbott and Costello did a routine about mustard because fucking Costello didn't like mustard. And Abbott ended up having thousands of people thrown out of work and children starving and parents weeping in the streets because the mustard factories closed down because people like Lou Costello didn't want fucking mustard on their hot dogs. But I didn't like mustard either, and I identified with Lou, and I didn't care about those hungry children. Even when I was nine years old, it was all about upholding your principles and not liking mustard. Anyway, somebody also tweeted, because you scoffed at me when I said, you don't just eat those old mystery meat hot dogs, those little thin, pale things. You can cook them for a fucking day and a half, and they still don't even get any singe on them. They always just look like you know, a fucking Dalmatian's dick. You get those big Johnsonville sausages, like the Better Cheddars or the New Orleans style Andouille, Andouille, and and you put them on a bun that you well first of all you put those bad boys in the oven for about twenty minutes and get them where they've they've got a good sizzle on the outside and the skin is popped because they're nice and hot, and in the last six minutes or so you shove those buns in. On alongside them on the on the pan there, so they get nice and and toasty and got a little crisp to them. And then you put the the sausage dog inside the bun and you sprinkle on your onions. And you can you can also you can go your grated cheese if you want to put it back under the broiler and melt the grated cheese. That'd be even better. You can let the heat of the hot dog do it, and then you crown the achievement. With your favorite barbecue sauce, just dribble a stream right across. Not not a lot. You don't want to drown it. Just right across the top of that hot dog. Barbecue sauce. And that, my friends, is the way you eat a hot dog. And somebody tweeted here last week, did you see it, saying, yes, as a matter of fact, I tried a Johnsonville better cheddar with onions and barbecue sauce, and it was awesome. It was awesome. So one generic person with zero followers tweets you, agreeing with you. How do you know you, how many followers did you agree Agreeing chat? with you. It's probably you with a, with a burner account. I don't know how to do those, and you know it. I'm lucky to have the mistakes make me <laughs> the one true. I've got. <laughs> but. Listen, if you want to have a perfect hot dog, here's what you got to do. You get in your car. You go to either Coney Island or Oceanside, New York. You go to Nathan's. You get a hot dog. They're the tastiest hot dogs around. And... They have them at the Met games. Go to City Field. Support the Mets. Let's go, Mets. Oh, for fuck's sake. I knew you'd get a Mets plug in. So, but Stan Lane refused to eat hot dogs or even because 
a lot of times we were down south, you'd stop at a gas station convenience store and they'd have smoked sausages under, you know, next to the fried chicken underneath the hot food area and everything. And I'd get one of those sausages and beating it on a stick. And he'd go, look at all the gimmicks inside that, where they grind it up and stuff it in. That's why the, the phrase comes, you don't want to know how the sausage is made. But by the way, if everybody's wondering, while we're talking about some of these things you haven't heard, this is the drive through but we're, we've been cross-pollinating lately with the experience because, well, pizza and hot dogs is pressing news and has become a controversy, and we've been talking about it regularly. So if you're one of these fucking odd ducks that listens to the experience but not the drive through or the drive through but not the experience, and you don't know what we're talking about, it's not our fault. Listen to everything in order, and you'll be able to follow this. Are we going to address this water crap also? No, well, we'll do that this coming week on the experience because I have some emails, but I'm not prepared. Okay. But I wanted to ask you a question today that will further confound people. What are your, because I know you're going to have some weird answer to this. What are your side items when you eat pizza? There are no side items when you eat pizza. The pizza what? is the is the main event. And it's like when an old school wrestling show where there's only one match. You just get the pizza. No, 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 no. <clears throat> There's always a side item or a, a garnish of some kind. If you have a hamburger, you have fries, or if you have steak, you have a baked potato, or if you have fish and coleslaw or whatever, even buffalo wings and carrots and celery, right? To cool your mouth off. It's it's some it's right. a compliment. I agree with you about all of that. However, pizza is so special and so unique <sighs> that it requires none of that. Who gets a side item with pizza? Well, let me tell you. I'm going to explain to you who does that. Somebody that... Back in the 80s, traveled a lot, and before this advent of Uber Eats and everybody delivering and bringing shit to your door, you had to call Domino's or you're pretty much fucked unless you want to you know, go out in a strange town late at night, right? So I've eaten a lot of delivery pizza. And it occurs to me that there's two things that pizza does not have, Brian. One is potato crunch the crunch of a fried crispy potato now you can't eat french fries with a pizza because that's you're replicating your over carbon there and don't be a hero because you want to be able to consume as much meat as possible because the, the the crust is only there really to hold up the cheese and the fucking meat so you don't want to over carb you want to, you don't want to be a hero just like when you go to buffets load up on the meat and the seafood and 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 stay away from the fucking bread because you'll fill yourself up. Anyway. This is ridiculous. Well, I would always be in a hotel, and I'd be back from a show late at night, and this is back even before late night drive throughs in a lot of cases. You get, you know, the guys would go out to a bar and spend their money and engage in wanton ways, whereas I would have my wanton ways come to me, but I would also need to eat, so I'd get a pizza. And there's one thing that every hotel vending machine has, even back in those days, and that's potato chips. Sometimes, as a matter of fact, if you were availing yourself of delivery pizza from a local institution, they might also sell sandwiches. This for uh, Domino's sold sandwiches and everything. But they might have potato chips also so you can get them delivered, but you can always get potato chips at a hotel, right? So there is your side of potato chips with your pizza because that provides the crunch in the potato, which is the one thing the pizza does not have. Oh, but there's there's more. There's one other thing the pizza does not have, Brian. In much the same way, as you eat celery or carrots with your buffalo wings in order to cool your mouth after the spiciness of the main dish, there's one thing that goes with pizza. Dill pickle strips. And you can get those and you can get those dill pickle strips from these places that sell sandwiches in a pizza hut. They started selling sandwiches early. So you can get a side order of dill pickle strips and you take a bite of that spicy sausage pizza and that pepperoni goodness and that meaty flavor with that cheese and that sauce. And then you bite into that dill pickle strip and it cools your mouth with a burst a burst of cucumberish flavors that Bruce Pritchard would be petrified. As a matter of fact, if he sees you eat a pickle, he will make a face like he's trying to hold back a seven-year-old turd, and he will wince and turn away, much like Percy Pringle used to in a moment of, of, of terror in the end of his match. Oh, Bruce is scared of pickles. 
but a good dill pickle will add a tremendous amount to your pizza enjoyment. Okay, a few comments here, and then we actually may have to get to some wrestling content. One, I love pickles. I love half sour pickles, even some dill pickled chips. I love them on my burgers. Having them a pizza is disgusting, and you're going to lose the audience with that. Now, this may be controversial. Every now and then I like them, but maybe the most overrated food in the world are buffalo wings or chicken wings. What? They're just a waste of time. They're no, just, what? <sighs> they're just tiny. You have to pick them apart to get anything. There's a lot of bone. Why would anyone want that? And then the boneless ones are just bullshit. Well, the boneless wings aren't wings. They're chunks of, of white meat chicken breast. That's right. So I, yeah, I got you there. But actually, there's nothing wrong with good old fried chunks of white meat chicken breast, but don't call it a wing. It's just like some of this modern wrestling. It might be entertaining, but don't call it wrestling. Don't call that a wing. See, that's a fucking... Because the, actually, the fact of the matter is the boneless wings are pushed by restaurants because they're quicker to cook and actually cheaper to obtain. And less messy for the customer. So, I mean, I see some merit there. But no, but, but, but no. the messiness into the, into the equation as well. The wings, the idea of the wings is because you have, it's like a mini drumstick. You have the crispy skin to bite into and then the succulent mixture of the meats. It's not quite dark, but it's not quite white. It's all together there. And and then you can turn it around, like eat the corn on the cob, where you can go from all sides there. I don't like the little two-bone wingies. I like the little drummies. Whenever I go to the Lube or Buffalo Wild Wings or whatever, I try to get all drummies whenever possible. But the experience of eating the wing and then licking all the daggum sauces off, go to the Lube. They've got 30 different sauces. Their sauces will make your tongue slap your brains out. So you won't and eat you can frog's get all... legs. You won't eat frog's legs. No, why would I eat a... What has a frog ever done to me? But you're eating the chicken wing. Well, a chicken pissed me off one time when I was a kid. And why the fuck do they call it a buffalo wing? Well, they call it a... Bu buffaloes don't obviously have wings, you <laughs> cretin. <laughs> obviously. You ought to know that because buffalo was the place where they started set. Wings used to be garbage. They used to throw the wings away. Nobody wanted the wings. The wings were too small. They couldn't figure out to, what to do with the wings. The wings were dreck. Like tater and they tots. Would, but, but then, oh, for heaven. Yeah, you, no, tater tots were like the, the garbage from the French fries. And they started just putting them together to make tater tots. And that I don't believe that. But anyway, <laughs> nevertheless, you're, you're completely off your rocker. But anyway, <laughs> and they started selling the wings at the Anchor Bar up there in Buffalo. The first time I had wings was like 1987, 88. Crockett runs, or you know what? It was WCW by that point. They were the only ones stupid enough to go up there regularly. Um, and I say that not because it was rotten, but because we didn't draw. But Syracuse, Rochester, Buffalo. We did all three of those uh, together, right? Say three days in a row. And I go in this restaurant next to the hotel and Buffalo wings. What the fuck would that be? Chicken spicy. So well, it sounds good to me. Holy shit. I fell in love instantly. You know, who has great wing besides Martin's barbecue here in Louisville, they have smoked wings. Oh my God. They're so good. And don't dip them in the ranch dip them in their comeback sauce. Oh, guys, man, the best, the best hush puppies in the world. Actually, the comeback sauce comes with the hush puppies, but you can also dip these smoked wings in a Martin's barbecue. Again, I said it, um, comeback sauce. Oh, you're Northern. Um, <laughs> it, it, it would kind of be, it looks like thousand Island, but it doesn't taste like it, but it has goodness all in it. I don't know. Anyway, so you don't eat any side items with your pizza. You think tater tots were the fucking dreck out of the bottom of the fryer. Can Listen, you hear me pounding my desk I, in frustration I at you? I, I feel the same way. If I wasn't wearing this headset, I'd be ripping my hair out, but I love my hair. Um, <laughs> no, pizza, the whole idea of pizza, of getting a pizza pie, is to get as much pizza as you can inside of you if you're getting a good pizza, which... Thankfully, we're blessed here in the Northeast with nothing but good pizza everywhere you turn. Wait a so you minute. you don't have to no, worry about no. my See, bullshit you, pizza no. tastes so shitty. I need potato chips and pickles to dull the pain in my mouth from this bullshit <laughs> pizza. 
The pain is now in my ears. You cannot make a blanket statement. You not out of your chicken lips, Brian Last. Can you make the blanket statement that there is no crummy, stinky pizza in the Northeast whatsoever? I guarantee you go to some fucking street in Bridgeport, Connecticut, where they used to film those raw opens without having to dress a set. And it looked like a goddamn, you know, fucking Russian gulag. And tell me that the <laughs> joint on the corner that sells fucking racing forms, lottery tickets, and pizza has gourmet pizza, and I'll kiss your white ass on Broadway. You know, real quick on that topic before we move on, I promise we will. <laughs> I think per capita, the city that I've seen the most response from, or at least representing about this pizza debate, where people say, oh, no, you're missing it. The best pizza is in this place. New Haven, Connecticut, which surprised me. You know, but I'll tell you one thing. When I lived in Connecticut, I didn't go all the way to New Haven for pizza. Uh, it wasn't that far up the road, but they had a great place in Monroe, Connecticut, which was where Bruce lived. Because this, I've said this before, this was our uh, work day until J.J. Dillon quit and Bruce got called in to serve in the office and then I had to, to tally along with him. But... I would go to his house and get there at like 10 o'clock in the morning, allegedly on the mission of writing raw, or we didn't have SmackDown then, raw or syndicated television, superstars, whatever. And we'd sit and talk for a couple hours about ideas and stuff. And I, I learned this quickly. The reason why we didn't really put anything on paper past making notes is because Vince was going to tear it all up and tell us what to do anyway. But early, early on in the relationship, I thought I was going to fucking write television. And uh, we would talk in the morning, and then we would go to a pizza place for lunch that was just a mile or so from his place, and they had a white sauce pizza with seafood on it and shrimp and little scallops and stuff. That was good. Oh. They had a variety of pizzas, very good pizzas all the way around. All kinds of traditional and off-kilter pizzas, but they were very good. Seafood and pizza don't mix. However, it is acceptable to have fried calamari before the pizza. Oh, God. And here we go, Miss Manners. With your, it's acceptable in polite society. Anyway, I'm telling a story about fucking the artful Dodgers. So <laughs> we go back from lunch to his house and we go out in the backyard. We throw the stick and play fetch with his fucking dog. And we do this all. <laughs> and, and when she, he turns on the TV and we watch some fucking, I don't know, Maury Povich or whatever was on in the afternoon that time. I, and after a few days, this, I said, aren't we supposed to be writing television? And that's when he told me, he said, no, you don't understand. We're getting ideas, and then we're going to take the ideas to Vince, and then he's going to tell us what we can do with those ideas and give us his ideas that we're going to then fucking write. And this was when TV was monthly. So there was no sense. Vince was going to change his mind easily weekly. So we're just getting ideas to pitch to him, and by the time the next TV taping cycle rolls around, he's going to have told us what we're going to fucking do. So I said, well, then why am I here at your fucking house? Why am I not at my fucking house and we're just doing this on the phone? He said, because that way, if anybody from the office calls, including Vince, we're right here working. Oh, fuck. So anyway, it was a good pizza place in Connecticut. That's where I was going with that. But I'll tell you, let me just put the period on the pizza business. I have an email from Charlie in Starkville, Mississippi. No, you don't. Come yes, on. I do. <laughs> Come on. And he says, hi, guys, Stromboli's in Starkville, Mississippi, has some of the best pizza you will ever taste. You can load it up with toppings or go just cheese. The key to Stromboli's is the crust. Thanks, Charlie from Starkville, Mississippi. Well, thank you, Charlie. You added nothing to this conversation. Well, besides that, he, he kind of halfway fucking sucked up to you because saying the key to Stromboli's is the crust. That's the, the, the crust is what that's like saying the key to the cake is the is the is the actual cake. No, it's the icing. The cake is there to hold up the icing. The crust is there to hold up the toppings. No, and that's what I've got to say about that. Well, I'll tell you. All right, then. You know what? You know what? I don't have a segue, so I'll just go ahead and say this. The only way in the world that you are ever going to make me believe that Charlie from Starkville, Mississippi was not sucking up to you just now is to sue me in open court. Do you have any ideas of who could perform that? I have a lawyer of choice. However, I think it may be a conflict of interest if I engage him to sue you, unfortunately, because he would well, be the only person I would call. 
but why wouldn't you call him? Because then when you sued me, I could turn around and have him sue you because he represents me as well. And of course, who are we talking about? Who, who, who? I have to think if you don't know who, that means you're new to the program because I'll tell you who. Call Stephen P. New. Show or two. He'll sue the well, I don't know about the segue, but I'll tell you one thing. He will sue your fucking ass off. Well, Steve, he's sending me paperwork. He has sued everybody, including the mailman, over some of this fraud and misrepresentation that's been cast my way by the Outlaw Mud Show gang. Uh, but he also takes on the really important cases, the kind of cases that affect your life or your family's life or your friend's life. And we've given testimonial after testimonial on the program here of how many people have either contacted Stephen from out there in the cult of Cornette, or he has referred them to someone else who specializes in that area, or they have, they've referred their friends or a member of their family because of something they've heard on the program. But we've had the email from the guy who said, I would have never tied the cancer diagnosis that my family member got to what was it at that time? It was at the roundup or it was something else that Steven was working on. But anyway, he, he got, uh, he got his family member hooked up with representation through that. So it can work for you too, folks. Um, newlawoffice.com 888-692-8084 is the magic number. And you see him all over Twitter and he's going to be there in Circleville also. So I hope he's bringing a sack of about two or 300 t-shirts with him because he just sent out 800 the other day. I believe he might be out of the t-shirt business. He t- Did you see Steven tweet about the t-shirts? Oh, just shoot up here amongst us because one of us needs some relief. Yeah, by the way, Steven, don't send all of those new ones out. I want one before you run out. Those w- new ones look fantastic. Well, it, it, Sin is already wearing hers because, of course, she's on the back of it also. And, uh, but anyway, uh, uh, apart from free t-shirts, cause he's just that kind of guy, Steven can go to work for you and navigate the treacherous waters of the legal system. And he will be there. As I said, in Circleville, signing autographs, kissing babies, possibly running for office along with cult members like Neil Shockett and jacked up Jeremy Bagley. And John's going to fall all the way from Baltimore and, so many more are making that trip, but uh, you will actually be able to possibly. I, Stephen might even set up one of those booths. Like, remember in Peanuts, Lucy used to set up the psychiatric booth, advice, five cents. I'm thinking there's been inflation, <laughs> but maybe Stephen should set up a booth, legal advice, you know, $20 or whatever. It's still much less than you'll pay any anywhere else, and he would clean up. Anyway, he's already cleaning up. He's undefeated. He's like Perry Mason. No, Perry Mason lost a case. Come to find out later on, it was, you know, reversal. Reversal on the decision. But uh, I don't know that Stephen has ever lost a case. He's, he's, he's amazing. Anyway, the... Modern era Melvin Belli can go to work for you at 888-692-8084, newlawoffice.com. That's right. I get we're, we're supposed to answer questions on this program, and we're also, yes, I've, we've even forgot to say we're going to talk about this All Elite Wrestling pay-per-view. That's another thing that took us a while to get the program out because it, it took me better part of four sittings to get as far as I could through this, this marathon. Uh, but w- one more email real quick I wanted to read before we get into the pay-per-view business because – I didn't know anybody still didn't know this. Well, I guess still didn't know it. I guess maybe new people have come along, obviously, and don't know this. But this is from Jack in Welch, West Virginia, a town I know well. There's no Welchers in Welch. Anyway, dear Mr. Cornette, I've been going back and watching old episodes of Championship Wrestling from Florida, and I have seen a preliminary wrestler named Jimmy Backlund. And seeing him, he bears a resemblance to the late gigolo Jimmy Del Rey. Are they one and the same? 
And do you think a faction as out of control as Kevin Sullivan's dark family could make it in today's wrestling? It's a bonus question, not really, except I think probably they were beating up Jimmy Backlund at the fucking time that he saw this. Oh, he also said, P.S., fuck pockets. He's a fucking joke. Thank you, Jack. Um, I thought everybody knew because we've told the story, but there's so many folks that have joined the, the Cornet Express here. It, Gigolo Jimmy Del Rey joined the heavenly bodies if you go back and and look he had no history beforehand this was the cool thing about the territories gigolo jimmy del rey did not exist until he joined the heavenly bodies but at that point he'd been in the business for 12 or 13 years and was one of the best workers in the fucking business but nobody knew who he was because he had he came along in the dying days of the Florida promotion, 85, 6, 7, where they used him as, as a job guy because he was a skinny, redheaded kid. That's why they named him Backlund, because he looked like fucking Bob Backlund with the red hair and the freckles, except he had more of the Chucky doll look to him, right? <clears throat> Which was his nickname in Smoky Mountain was Chucky. But he never got a chance to do anything because the territories died and there was no place to go and he was still a green kid and small, but he got to work with and train with so many of those great minds and talents that, that lived down there was still there at the end of then the independent scene in Florida, because they obviously, as soon as the Florida territory went out of business, they started running independent shows and he'd been working down there forever and <clears throat> just never got a chance to go anywhere. And that's when, in May, uh, in April, uh, well, I guess he, he would told me in March. In March of 93, was it? Was it 93 or 94? God damn it. It's 93. 93. 93. In March of 93, Stan Lane tells me, ah, fuck it, I'm going to quit. What? I'm retiring. I'm not wrestling anymore. I'm all shit. Um, Because he's, uh, you know, he and Tom Pritchard are the heavenly bodies, my top heel team. I said, I need to figure out some way to replace Stan. So obviously it was easier in the territory days when we had to replace Dennis. You know, everybody out there was doing top guys were doing television. And I had seen Tom Pritchard on the Continental Show and he was doing such good work there. I thought he's the guy that can do it. I didn't think of Stan because Stan and Steve, right? He was ingrained in my mind. He was already part of a team, but Steve Kern at that time was uh, leaving wrestling to get into real estate. Silly boy. He came back later, but anyway, so Stan was a single suddenly and they had bought Florida. So we got Stan, <clears throat> but anyway, that's why Tom became Stan's partner when I didn't have a chance to have Bobby. But the point is you could see everybody on TV. If you stayed up with the different territories and got the tapes, all the top guys, but now there were guys out there that nobody had had seen and and even people in the business weren't getting a chance to see because they weren't on television. But Kevin Sullivan, who was working for me, thank God, had lived in Florida and, and knew Jimmy Backlund. I told him, I said, how am I going to get another fucking heavenly body? He said, Jimmy, I can't do the accent, but Jimmy, what about this kid, the Boston accent? This kid, Jimmy Backlund in Florida, he can do everything, Jimmy. What a bumper. He's never had a chance. And I, I remembered him faintly, but I said, you know what? Fuck it. If Kevin says it, it's good enough for me. Jimmy Backlund is going to be the new fucking heavenly body. <clears throat> and we came up with Gigolo Jimmy Del Rey because a sweet Stan, doctor of desire. Uh, Del Rey was because Stan Lane's gimmick hometown was Del Rey Beach, Florida. So that was a little nod. And off we went. So you were still able then to find a guy that, like I said, had 10 or 12 years experience and was a top worker, but you could turn him into somebody else because he hadn't been seen. Now they're changing guys gimmicks when they've been on raw six weeks later, they come out as, as somebody else in another name on fucking raw. It's ludicrous. But this guy you could buy was a fucking top guy because he was never presented as anything other than a top guy. Because he'd never been anywhere before. He was new. Anyway. Is this hard to understand, Brian? And he was so sleazy. Oh, yeah. That it, and made, I mean, <laughs> that it made the gigolo name hysterical. Well, and plus the way he worked. It, 
he could do all that shit, but also he was so motivated. He was working his ass off because he'd waited 12 years to get a spot. And suddenly he's in, you know, the top, in a top heel tag team and in a territory that's doing better than anything except WWF at that time. We were beating WCW per capita. <clears throat> and then <laughs> it just so happened three months after he gets the gimmick, we debut on Raw. Perfect timing. He slid in there, which it led to, in some cases, some of the heat that Jimmy had with other people in the locker room and or the office because he went from the Indies to Raw, literally, with a stopover in Knoxville in three months. And his work in the ring was fine and could handle it because he'd been doing this for 12 years and worked with every top pro and veteran. But he was maturity. He was a little happy and surprised and pleased to be there and let it go to his head just a bit, just a bit. Well, if you remember too, you guys started, I think you started in what July of 93. Yeah. The end of July SummerSlam. It was the show was stolen by Jimmy Del Rey in that Steiner brothers match. And then yeah. Jerry Lawler, who was doing Memphis style stuff in that Bret Hart angle slash match, you know, they stole the show. Those two guys. Yeah. Cause it, well, we had the Steiners and, and, Rick and Scott were motivated to work with the heavenly bodies because they'd always liked working with the midnight express. And they knew that we were doing the same kind of shit with the bodies. We were going to put all their stuff over and make them look like a million dollars. That's why the road warriors like to work with the midnight express. Never got to work with the heavenly bodies. So the Steiners were like, we're not going to have to fight for anything. So, and, and they wanted to help us because we had a history so they were willing to, to do shit and let the bodies do their shit also. And it was Steiner's hometown and we knew how to get fucking heat on them. Right. So that was a great match. That's why we never had another fucking high profile match with the Steiners on WWF television. After that, it was too good. And like you said, Lawler was still, he, at that point, he was still young enough where he would, could really be himself as a heel in the ring and do the shit that nobody else in the WWF was able to do. And, and, and that's why I love to watch those matches with him and Bret Hart and just him in that time period, because a lot of times you'd be at TV and the monitor, you know, in the back where all the guys would pull up their folding chairs and, you know, watch the matches as they were taped. Right. Lawler would come in with one of the job guys, and a bunch of guys would get up and leave. I'm like, where are you going? I said, well, he's not going to do anything. I said, that's the point. It's the only one you can actually learn from. You fucking, I'm fixed. To, <laughs> I'm fixed to go down and teach in Louisville at OVW the exact same thing that Lawler is doing in the ring for these guys for free in front of them, and they can't figure out how to learn it. Which is why so many of those middle '90s WWF guys were just generic and bland. They learned how to do moves. They didn't learn how to fucking get over with people. You know, that period of time from the beginning of 93, just about when they introduced Monday Night Raw up through SummerSlam, there's probably no period of time where there's a bigger influence of Tennessee style wrestling in the WWF. Because those early Raws were great and they were doing angles just on the show. Janetti coming out of the crowd, programs just on that show. Like, I think it was Janetti versus Doink, Randy Savage versus Doink. They had a concession stand brawl. They had Luna and Sherry do a brawl. It was like Tennessee wrestling on WWF TV. Well, and that's until Jerry Jarrett realized that he's fucking sitting in Connecticut five days a week and drinking two fucking bottles of wine a night in this goddamn condo they gave him and said, I got to go back home. It, you know, and Vince had gotten off and not didn't go to prison, so he wasn't going to be running the thing. So he was, and that's once that whoever Vince is listening to can influence him in a direction. And sometimes it's the right direction. Sometimes it's the wrong direction. As you know, he got mad at everybody because of a rotten TV show from Germany or wherever the fuck that nobody thought was going to be any good anyway and started listening to shit stain. Well, at least during that time period, he was speaking to Jerry Jarrett on a regular basis and who was saying, you got to get some interest going in these things and people and et cetera, rather than just the blahness. And it, every, I don't know whether Vince took it because it was Jerry and he was actually the same age or maybe and had been in the business even longer 
or just because people like Bruce or whoever just would never just come out and tell him in a stern way. What the fuck? The fucking goon? T.L. Hopper? Shit like that. You know, because they're like, well, this is what he wants. Well, he's going to get it anyway, but I can't fucking, you know, what the fuck? Oh, God, don't even get me started on those fucking gimmicks. When I when I had to call a lot of those guys and sign them up, thinking we're, we're going to be bringing in a new crew on television to fucking work with our stars and, and get them over and potentially teach them something at the same time in the ring. So we'll find these good workers that haven't, you know, haven't been beat to death on our television and they give them all the fucking idiot goofy gimmicks and killed the whole thing before it got started. Hey, you brought, oh. up, you brought up before Vince when he got off on his uh, steroid distribution trial. I recently thought about that. Did you see the footage of Harvey Weinstein going into court with his walker and he's all bent over and he can't walk? Yes, yeah, yeah, Vince and was I'm, wearing a neck brace. Yeah, all of a sudden Vince had a neck brace on. All of a sudden his neck needed surgery right when Wait, he was on he, trial he took that opportunity to have that surgery he'd long needed on his neck is what i heard uh anyway you know what the point is when i think of these things i'm i'm i may be on the verge of needing therapy i'm not sure brian i've I tried you as my anger management counselor one time but and, and you see where that went i've never been in so much trouble <laughs> and since we've been together now so. think about this since we've been a guy i've never been in more trouble in my life constantly since you and I, I think you're a bad influence on me but no in all seriousness we've mentioned this before on the program and we've read some emails from some of the listeners and some of the members of the cult of cornet that had either had need of this service but didn't know how to how to find it or didn't know that it existed or later on when we plugged it and mentioned it said, oh, yeah, I've been using these guys, and they've helped us. The folks at BetterHelp, H-E-L-P, BetterHelp. Uh, it's in, not even on, you can be online, but also you can do phone or even video sessions with a therapist, professional counseling done securely online. It's not a crisis line. If, you know, if you're suicidal, obviously there's other places that you contact more immediately but this is a service that you can get a timely and and halfway of, of you know thoughtful professional responses from real therapists and some of the folks have said already that since we mentioned it the first time that they've either already been using them or been using them and and it's helped and especially for the folks who maybe don't live in a big market with a bunch of choices or any choices for mental health professionals, or, you know, if it is, it's your fucking brother-in-law's neighbor and you don't want to talk to him, right? Right. I say, I say, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Who is your brother-in-law's neighbor and why do you hate him so bad? No, I, he's all right. It's the brother-in-law's wife. That's the problem. <laughs> okay. Well, then you need, you need to call better help about that too. Anyway, what, visit their website and read the testimonials. Uh, they're they're posted daily. Uh, www dot as they say betterhelp h e l p dot com, and you can go slash reviews slash and even see the reviews. But if you go to betterhelp dot com slash drive, then you can get ten percent off of your first month's services. Betterhelp dot com slash drive. For the Jim Cornette drive through listeners only, right here, 10% off. And they've got apparently 700,000 people or a little better now taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional at BetterHelp. I think I need some. I need some, I need a professional after watching this pay-per-view is what I need. So you didn't like it? No, I, I there, see, here's the thing. The, Dennis Condry used to have another saying. When we would do the the fuck up spots and the stuff that made the people laugh at us because we were heels that had got foiled by the baby faces, right? When Bobby and Dennis would run into each other or whatever, the people would laugh. It didn't mean we were exposing the business by obviously cooperating with our opponents, but we had had a miscue and slipped and fell on our asses, and they liked that. And then as soon as we would take over on the Rock and Roll Express, some underhanded tactic, double team, whatever... Then they'd get mad. Dennis used to say, we made them laugh, and then we made them mad because we made them quit laughing. 
they made me like the show, and then they made me mad because they made me quit liking it. I shall explain further, but yes, there was a lot of good stuff on here, and then they just can't help themselves. But did did you watch the pre-show? Because now apparently, I, it, sometimes uh, there's a pre-show and a pre-pre-show, and sometimes I don't see shit or whatever, but I taped, because I was in Oklahoma, I taped, taped, recorded the pay-per-view on my DVR, and I it started at 7 o'clock Eastern time, so I got the packages building up the main matches and the Dork Order SCU match. Did you see that part of, of the programming? I didn't see the tag match, and I didn't watch the pre-show, but I think I saw all those packages because they did a special show after dynamite on wednesday and i'm assuming it's the same packages i thought those are great i thought it was really well done well yeah well good then at least you saw those because this is what i say when i say the 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 show is somewhat schizophrenic in that the the mjf and cody history package was a work of art a personal issue between two guys that used to be friends you sh we saw them in the happy times and then we saw the 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 turn and it was even explained well that Cody stuck with him when everybody else knew he was a prick. It was perfect. And not only whoever's editing, but also, you know, whoever shot this stuff and the sit down, they, they know what they're doing is great. It was a work of art. Moxley and Jericho was a great job because they, both those packages, the guys came off as serious. They were done believably. They came off as athletes that were either going for the championship or or was going to settle a personal issue. Then here comes the Bucks and Omega and Page package. And I'm sorry, but the contrast to me was here the Bucks are annoying and come off as Marks and fanboys talking about booking their fucking angles and their fantasy thing or in the hotel room or whatever the fuck. And oh gosh, we spend so much time in Japan because that's like, you know, to me, that's like, that means you can't get work in this country. I'm, anyway, it the whole story of tension in the Bullet Club makes them all, to me, look like a bunch of whiny bitches instead of tough or badass or somebody was stabbed in the back or something that we should give a shit about. It's just tiny little tension amongst these whiny fucking fanboys. Do, do you see this, or am I just overly fucking touchy? I think, in some sense, you're overly touchy when it comes <laughs> to the Bucks and Omega. However, I do think, and maybe I'm in the minority, I do think the Bucks come across as incredibly disingenuous in almost everything they say all the time. Uh, so, to that point, I think you're right. However, I have, I think I've said it on the show, I've been intrigued by where they're going with the Adam Page stuff. They've got me and, and clearly the audience caring yeah. about Adam Page now. And even the Adam Page Omega dynamic, I'm interested, because they're so radically different. One's a goofball and one's Adam Page. You know, one's drinking and the <laughs> other one's like, I'm hanging out with this drunk guy. They don't exactly explain why they're still friends or anything. Well, yeah, that's, that's the amazing thing is that they've made Adam Page an irresponsible drunk and made him popular for it. But maybe that's because people see much of themselves in him. <laughs> in that audience i guess i don't know but but anyway that package and then they did a package on Rio and nyla rose and seriously i fast forwarded through that because anything where no, i was chris I, statlander and and nyla rose well it, it started out with i'm sorry it started out with Rio, where rose beat Rio. that's what that's when i started fast forwarding because i'm just gonna start fast forwarding anything that where they have to tell me that a 90 pound woman has been a professional wrestler since she was nine years old. I'm just going to, we may have to retire Riho cause I'm just tuning that out. As soon as I saw Riho and Rose, I, I skipped ahead. Um, the tag match that you didn't see the dork order and SCU. I wish you had seen this because this was, <clears throat> it was a perfect example of, Two different teams at two different levels having two different matches. The, the baby faces come in and hit hot and jump start the thing. But of course, they immediately have to go to the floor and then they're all back in and they're going 100 miles an hour and they didn't slow down. And Pizzeria Uno looks like shit. 
But finally, they got heat on Frankie Kazarian in some respect. It's a horrible gimmick. I wrote down here, I'm looking at my notes. They don't match as a team. One guy's dressed up as some kind of fucking S&M character, and the other guy's a goddamn, you know, Viking or whatever the fuck he is. I don't know. People weren't caring about it. But here's the thing. Finally, I've been mentioning hot tags, hot tags. Frankie Kazarian hit the perfect hot tag. He flipped over one guy. He rolled under the other guy. He made a dive. And Scorpio Sky makes a nice comeback, right? And it, it possibly, apparently, potatoed Pizzeria Uno because shit got awkward for a minute because Uno was down holding his head, but they kept going. But then suddenly, Stu Grayson, the heel, does a snazzy move and a backwards flip into a double kick and stops both baby faces by himself out of their comeback, and then walks over and tags old Uno, and the heels just took over and just double-teamed the baby faces to death in front of the fucking referee. This is after the comeback. Just baby face, or just... Which referee? Which referee? Was it the bald one? Oh, God, aren't they all? Because that guy's the worst. I mean, I don't know if it's if I should blame him or if he's just told, ignore the rules at certain points, and then... Pay attention well, to I'm sure, other points. I'm sure he's told that, but it, I mean, he would you be scared of his authority? He looks like a god. He went to give blood and forgot to say when. <laughs> he's on his fucking deathbed hooked up to a machine, and they rolled him out there. He's pale. He's translucent. He's got propecia or whatever. He's as bald as a peeled egg. Anyway, and so they double-team the baby faces in front of the referee. Then suddenly... SCU foils a move by doing God damn. I can't remember which one was which now, but they one guy monkey flipped his partner out of the corner. Ah, sky monkey flipped Kazarian. I think out of the corner into a fucking double clothesline on both heels that popped the people big and God, that could have been a fucking finish, but no, they went for some more bullshit and the creepers jumped up. And then they hit fucking Scorpio Sky from behind and pinned him. Dork Order beat SCU. I wrote down, criminal, how are they still doing this? How did the fans react to the Dork Order? Well, they didn't give a shit. They were kind of fucking shocked that SCU got beat, but they don't care because it's a fucking goofy deal to begin with. And the Creepers are still apparently untrained twats that walked in off the street. But it gets better. Guess who made the fucking save? Christopher Daniels. We're in Chicago. What kind of big name can they bring in to really give the people a fucking jolt as a surprise? Road Warrior Animal. Eh. I, I don't know. <laughs> I've run out of names. Cold Cabana. Oh, God, yeah. I actually did read about that now that I think. Cold Cabana runs down and may patient zero of comedy wrestling. Why shouldn't he come home? Uh, he comes down and makes a save, and then the heels jump him and get heat. And then the music plays for the dork order, and here comes a guy in a black robe. Well, it's the almighty chosen one or fearless leader or whoever they've been milking, right? Holy shit. And he gets down to ringside and he throws the robe off and it's Christopher Daniels and he sparks a baby face comeback. And, the, and then the heels start bumping out. I'm, I wrote, Jesus Christ, this is all so phony and contrived. How would these guys know their fucking almighty leader wasn't already in the building or not in the building? How would they think that fucking crap? Who played the goddamn music? What the? It's like a goddamn dramatic community theater production where wrestling matches occasionally break out. It doesn't make sense. You can't do s s swerves like that or like shit stain type of booking that just started 20 years ago when everybody stopped knowing what the fuck they were doing. The heels just look fucking idiots, idiots, like complete morons because they don't know that this guy isn't their fearless leader that they obviously would know whether he was in the building or not. Who's playing the fucking music. Cabana makes a 15 second save and then gets shut down. So thanks for coming Colt. And then they announced, well, we've signed him. Well, fuck. He did fuck all there. I, it, uh, 
<clears throat> I mean, at least it, they're keeping most of the rot around the dork order and anybody that's associated with them. But still, why the fuck are they still trying to do this? Just cut fucking bait. Admit that you made a mistake. You know, the whole Colt Cabana comedy wrestling thing really offends me. Not as a wrestling fan, but as a comedy fan. As a comedy fan, He yes. is so not funny. <laughs> it's I've ridiculous. Seen, I've seen clips, and I'm, you know, and I don't mean to be jumping on Colt Cabana again, but, you know, he's a better wrestler, and he is a fucking comedian, and, you know, you can take that line any way you want it. Anyway, so they go to the back on this pre pregame program for an interview with the Jurassic Express, Luchasaurus and Jungle Boy and the Goofy Kid. And Luchasaurus starts out again after 65 million years. He doesn't talk like a badass. He talks like a fucking twerp. You've got that body, all those tattoos, the fucking mask, and he talks like a goddamn nerd cashier at a fucking comic book shop. He has no concept of what his fucking gimmick should sound like, and apparently nobody's fucking telling him. Why in the world would you sound like a goddamn, you know, the, I don't Was it anyway? Were, were they playing it for laughs? No, he was actually being, that's the way he talks, apparently. He's using his real voice and real pattern of speech, apparently, which sounds like a goddamn nerd at a fucking comic book store. Instead of a goddamn giant fucking dinosaur that would eat your head off. All right. Start eating cars and eating bars, and now he only eats guitars. Get up. Hey. <laughs> All right. First rap song to go to number one. And then they did a Young Bucks fucking autobiography package on a, their, their backyard wrestling dreams to the top. Oh, joy. Uh, they did really bad stagey voiceover work. Apparently, they cannot read copy about themselves with any feeling. And then some other professional voiceover guy told everybody how glorious it was that they'd started out in the backyard wrestling with all their friends, and now they're doing the same thing on national TV, playing wrestler with all their friends. Well, you know, let me stop you here, Jim, because obviously a lot of questions came into the drive-thru asking your opinion about the idea that they're putting out a memoir, a duly written, I guess, memoir, where I'm sure there'll be lots of complaining about people like you and new japan who didn't just let them do everything they wanted whenever they wanted any thoughts about their upcoming memoir i'll say the same thing as when shitstain wrote one i can't believe he wrote a book i didn't know he'd ever read one um and I, they've had this long journey in obscurity in independent wrestling until they got on national 10, I guess they'll make a big deal out of Japan and everybody will go, what the fuck? This isn't exactly fucking James J. Dillon's book or Bobby Heenan's book or whatever the fuck, but uh, yeah, they, they can have a book. Everybody can have a book. But see, the thing I have is, no, they didn't, you know, they, they didn't mean anything in Japan. I mean, that's the thing I think a lot of people miss. No, I didn't say they meant anything. I said, they'd make a big deal out of it. Cause you know, it's, it's like the fucking goofy outlaw group that actually ran their own shows in Japan and flew their guys over to draw three hundred people they can say we just sold out in japan it, it's it's yes if you if you had a job with baba or enoki in the 70s and 80s or if you had a, a fucking spot with a major company at major events since then yes japan may be something to brag about but not just because you've been there and wrestled because now as we know they've got as many fucking outlaw mud shows in japan as the and Apparently, 57 promotions that use middle school fucking girl children as professional wrestlers now in Japan. So just because you've been there, eh. But the thing is, they whine so much about New Japan and how unhappy they are with the way New Japan treated them. They were opening match tag team guys. They weren't in the main events ever. Like that, that, I feel like unless you paid attention to it or talked to a Japanese reporter like I have, you may miss that point. They weren't Kenny Omega. Kenny Omega was a big star in New Japan. He was in the main events. They weren't even close to that. They were opening match guys. Ugh. But you listen to them, and it's like, you know, New Japan dropped the ball with them. You know what? If they wanted to have an argument, the Bucks and Kenny Omega still had the dissension in the fucking Bullet Club and all this stuff. 
they ought to just come out because later on the Bucks are actually going to end up being uh, going going with it and being the nominal heels in the fucking match. Buck says, "Hey, Kenny, you know, d- did it ever just occur to you that the reason why that we're not happy with you anymore is because you're just a pretentious twat and you're not doing anything like what you were doing in Japan because you don't have those guys to carry you." <laughs> And Omega could say something about, well, how long are you guys going to be the young bucks? How, you know, how far into your forties are you going to be the young bucks? And, uh, I, you know, something purse, I don't know. But anyway, the young bucks autobiography got a little package there. I hope there's a chapter about their political and religious views. That will interest a lot of people, I think. Oh, God, that's right. They're not only right wing crackpots, but religious nuts too, aren't they? No wonder that we never really got along or, or fucking clicked to begin with before they even started super kicking small children for their birthdays. I'd like, to, yeah, I'd like it, to see if the book addresses their thoughts on if Obama was born in America. That's what I'd like to see in that book. Oh, n- no, you're kidding. They're not some of them, too. Holy shit. All right. Very good. It, well, they, they love conspiracy theory. You've heard them tell the story that I asked to work with them, right? You know, I heard the story when it actually happened from you, and then I've heard their <laughs> version of it repeated over and over again that you came over to them and begged them, like, oh, you know, everyone believes that we should do something together, yeah, which we I'm should like, really do something. Everybody believes this, which completely for, doesn't sound like something you would do to anyone who actually knows you. Well, for the uninitiated, what was it? Was it 2015 or 2016? Jeff Jarrett did the first round of Global Force wrestling events. And they were with the in conjunction with the minor league ball teams in Jackson, Tennessee, and Knoxville, and in uh, Bowling Green, Kentucky. Um, it was at one of those because he was using you know guys that had been with TNA and guys that were available. He asked me to come to those because I could do the not only the VIP meet and greet and qualify as a legend, and I was drivable, so he knew I'd do it, but also because he had radio guys and uh, baseball guys in corners and matches. He knew I could help put those together. So, okay. So fine. The young bucks are on one of the shows. I think it was the standalone may have been either in Bowling Green or in Jackson, Tennessee. Anyway. So I'm, I, you know, get the scoop. I'm wandering around with the format. Uh, we're going to, we've done the autographs. Now I'm going to go find the fucking guys from the radio station. And I walk in a locker room and I've mentioned this before. This was where I saw it badly. There's 12 guys in the locker room and it's one of those big minor league baseball locker rooms. So, it, 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 you know, there's plenty of room and there's tons of couches and there's a little cubby holes you sit in as the lockers and everything. And every single wrestler in this locker room is either sitting on a couch or laying on the floor with their head on their bag, looking at their fucking phones. Nobody is saying a word. These are the most boring guys used to be showing naked pictures of rats and fucking telling stories and fucking goddamn ass and off and setting fire at each other's shit, whatever. They're noodling on their fucking phones. Nobody's saying a word. Well, I'm walking through and there's the bucks sitting there on the couch. Well, I don't want to be a complete prick because there's been heat to that point because this is after they super kicked the fucking grade school kid for his birthday. So as I'm walking through, I said, hey, bucks, I said, how you doing? We got the only angle of wrestling people believe. And I walked right out the other side. <laughs> I was being a smart ass because it didn't have to be said at the end is that's because it's fucking real, you little twerps. But I was being a smart ass, and still at the same time, nobody could say I was unprofessional and didn't acknowledge them. You mean and you, they weren't, said, you weren't pitching an angle that you could work on multiple independent shows throughout the country? And no, the, all the ones that I didn't do because I didn't want to, no. And, and, they, and they responded, hey, Jim, and that was it. And then they went ahead and did their match, and then I was in the main event with the stars and the radio DJs. So <laughs> anyway, but that was the big pitch for the big angle. Uh, so where were we on that? Let's go back to the pay-per-view. Because at least now you, you picked it up with Dustin and Jake Hager, right? The first match. Yes. I, well, yes. it took me, I missed a little bit of it because for some reason I kept getting the Spanish commentary. So I'd have to restart the Bleacher Report live to get the JR and Shivani and Excalibur. Wait a minute. Start the Bleacher Report. How the fuck does that happen? What well, do you do there? I, I didn't do it through the cable box. I did it online. That way I could stream it throughout the house on various. If I was downstairs, because we had a party that day here in the oh, house. Oh, for heaven's so sake. So I was in the den 
and I put it on the big screen there. And then eventually I came up to the office and I put it on the TV up here. So I just had it on my phone and I was shooting it to whatever monitor I was near. Yeah, fuck you. Anyway, <laughs> I, pe- I pressed a button and ordered the goddamn thing on my one television and I recorded it so I wouldn't have to watch it all the way through in one shot. Anyway, the opening match, Dustin Rhodes against Jake Hager. I wrote, God, Hager's music sucks. I don't know what the fuck that is, but his entrance music sucks. And then he starts making out with a girl who then we are told is his wife at ringside. So this is going to figure out or figure in. So this is fine. It's a fucking hot match. They started out fighting. I don't know if I once again would go out in the people immediately. It's just that's so overdone, but I guess it gives them a thrill, and now you can do it without anybody getting stabbed. But, you know, I prefer to see the fucking initial flurry bumps in the ring where everybody can see them, and it makes noise, and it's exciting, and then maybe you go out on the floor and rattle something around and back in and out the other side, but whatever the fuck. But Dustin took it to him, and then, because this is the first time we've seen Hager wrestle, He's got to look strong, so he leveled him with a fucking clothesline on the floor. And at that point, he already had some heat. People are chanting Jericho's bitch, which was the T-shirt that Dustin had and everything. So they've started off good. Excalibur was especially fucking rotten here, I thought, talking about Dustin's body shutting down from liver shots. I was thinking of liver spots. I was like, he's not that old. (laughs) Um... But you can tell Hager's green, and because he works a shoot style, he's a little herky-jerky anyway, but Dustin kept it going. Then the one part I didn't understand is when Hager went over to his wife, you you saw that by this point, Hager's getting the heat on Dustin, yeah. he's kicking shit out of him. He goes over to his wife, and he stands there, she's chewing him out about something or whatever the fuck, but it took forever, and then suddenly Dustin comes and takes him out. You know, boom. He'd been distracted standing there doing nothing for 30 seconds, not even keeping an eye. See, that was a buzz kill. That took me out of the fucking thing. They'd had me up till then, but all of a sudden, for no apparent reason and for way too long, he just goes over and gets in an argument with his wife. But then, so he should have expected that Dustin was going to come, but Dustin takes him out. And thankfully got the people back. He did the fucking big kiss spot with her, which got the huge pop and all the way going back to the fucking, you know, days of uh, sunshine and precious. That one always g- gets over. Um, I would, I don't know why. Uh, I, apparently they just put her there just for that spot really, because she hasn't been on television and hasn't been acknowledged. And then suddenly she's there. So I guess they just wanted to do the spot, but I love the spot. So I don't care, but it, it would help if we knew who these people were before they show up at ringside the first time ever. Anyway. Um, so then out of the kiss, kiss spot, Dustin starts a big comeback and it started going a bit too long. Then I think it once, once the Dustin made the comeback, especially as limited as Hager is, I think they should have probably gone into whatever they were going to do. But then Hager turned around and got some more heat on fucking Dustin. And, you know, then Hager took that nice bump over the top face first to the steps. That's a nice, that was a bit of a great bump for an injury or a count out. <laughs> or whatever, but he took that great bump and he was back in the ring seconds later and not bleeding and not, you know, uh, they, uh, is it me or are they just starting to put matches together based on spots they want to do or bumps they can take rather than the other way around? There's some of that. Um, at that point, I, uh, Jake's wife, I wrote as a terrible actress because she was phony when he was fucking getting the shit kicked out of him. Dustin made another comeback. Hager gets the ankle lock, then nut shot, triangle choke, tap out. What'd you think of the tap? I know he's a shooter, but what did you think of that finish? Why it was a triangle choke while Dustin was mostly standing up. It was the kind of choke we've never really seen in professional wrestling used. Uh, or at least I haven't, I was wondering, I'm like, is that supposed to be a choke? And then when he tapped out, I was like, okay. And then I started convincing myself, okay, I guess that's an appropriate choke. If it's going to be something he regularly uses now, then it makes sense. 
I hope he don't regularly use it because it's flatter than a plate full of piss. People didn't, uh, people, I know in a real fight, yes, it don't matter whether the people get it or not. When your hand goes up, they'll fucking pop, right? But in a building that big, crowd that big, they need to see what's going on. They're, they did a variety of things. The ankle lock, you could tap out too, because it's been established. Ken Shamrock, Kurt Angle, Kurt Angle, Kurt Angle. A nut shot. That would have fucking been great if he'd have just gone down and boy, what a heel, you know, because he's been doing the fucking nut shot thing. Or some other type of submission where the guy is blatantly to everybody in the building. He He's the one in the hold and the other one's the guy putting on the hold and one guy's down and the other guy's in charge, but both guys were standing up next to each other in what looked like to the folks in the cheap seats a top wrist lock. It was flatter than a plate full of piss, flatter than four o'clock, flatter than a flitter, as my Aunt Lola used to say. It, 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 he should have got a one, two, three fuck or a better tap out, one or the other, is all I'm saying. I'm not disagreeing with the result because that's what it needed to be, but yeah. I watched that match with some people who are not wrestling fans currently, but I guess used to watch it because the first thing I heard was, oh my God, is that Jim Ross and is that Gold Dust? I mean, that was the first things they said, but the spot that got over the most in my house was when he had the shirt that said Jericho's bitch, and they went right to a camera shot of Hager, and you could just read his lips. He goes, motherfucker. That, that got over yeah. big time in the house. Everyone liked that. The non-wrestling fans like that, I should say. Uh, but anyway, it is pay-per-view, folks, so we can be a little looser. Um, Sammy Guevara and Darby Allen was a pleasant surprise to me in some ways, and in some ways was indicative of everything that's wrong with what the fuck they're doing. I shall explain. Darby Allen is over. He's got the weird-looking face paint gimmick. He's got skateboard. He does the flying shit, and he's not only smaller, so more sympathetic, but also more artful with the flying shit than almost anybody, right? So he's really getting over. And he lays his stuff in. And he lays his stuff in and it doesn't look bullshit and he's reckless with himself, which he really shouldn't be, but it makes the shit look better. Um, now here, so, and Sammy Guevara, slappable face, great heel, a fucking persona, painfully thin. I'd love for him to gain some weight or at least get a tan. As Arn Anderson says, fat looks better brown and white and so does skinny. But, but he is a heat getting little fucker. And they did some great shit. And the people loved it, and they loved Darby Allen, but their match was backwards. Or actually, not even backwards. It was inverted. The, it, Darby Allen starts with the dive, right? And the fighting on the floor and into the rails. Some fans going to get their teeth knocked out. Uh, then did another dive and hooked the ropes and was short on it and almost killed himself heads for, head first. But they didn't start the match yet. That old that old gimmick where the, they, you know, immediately started fighting. The referee and called for the bell. <clears throat> but after your minutes into this, without getting in the ring, why would the referee have not called for the bell or done something? And then the reason why you find out later on that the referee didn't call for the bell and they didn't start the match is because Sammy Guevara it pulls out a table. And does a double 630 or 720 or what, however many degrees that is, splash off the top rope onto the Darby Allen on the table on the floor. And then they ring the bell and start the match. It looked fantastic. You could have done that on free television. Sammy Guevara could have goddamn jumped Darby Allen, hammered him a couple times, put him on the table and done that move and put him through the table and hyped up their pay-per-view match. But now he has done a decimating, devastating hospitalization angle move to this fucking 150 pound kid. And now they're going to ring the bell and have a match. Did that dawn on you when that happened? It did seem like they did a lot before the bell. <laughs> I and now, this, that first dive he hit on Sammy was great, by the way. Well, yes. Like I said, he lays stuff in. 
he just ran as fast as he could and did that dive, and it had a lot of impact. I thought it was great. You're and you're trying to ignore my point. They did a fucking <laughs> hospitalization angle to start the match, and now they get in the ring and have them. And they, I guess, they drug the table wreckage out of the way. And of course, Sammy Guevara gets heat on Darby Allen for a few seconds, and then Darby Allen is making a comeback. I wrote this entire match is backwards. What the fuck? Then Sammy Guevara does a diving foot stomp off the top rope onto the apron on Darby Allen and gets a two count. Sammy Guevara does a Spanish fly off the top rope onto Darby Allen and gets a two count. Darby Allen monkey flip Sammy Guevara into the bear turnbuckle that they've taken the pad off of. Then as he turns around, cause he don't go down, hits him with a stunner and then does a coffin drop off the top rope on him and finally gets the three count. <clears throat> they went through three different angles and six different finishes in this fucking match. And, and none of that was as devastating that he did for the finish was as devastating as either the splash through the table or even the goddamn Spanish fly that he did or that the other guy did or whatever this, I don't fucking know. I, I Somebody needs to, to, well, you know what? This is the young bucks thing. The young bucks thing. Their statement was always, well, we never got over until we started breaking all the rules that everybody told us not to break. Yeah, because fucking little twerps like you weren't designed to get over in the main event because you won't draw major mainstream money. However, I prefer Lance Storm's take on it from ECW. We were encouraged to break all the rules and then found out why there were rules. So if somebody would take these fucking guys and explain to them that they still need to put a match together that makes some kind of sense and <clears throat> possibly leave some angle or some bump left undone or untaken for the main events, then they, they've got talent, but they're not being produced. Well, they have agents there. So, I mean, what's the problem, you think? Well, your executive vice presidents are the exact epitome of why that, you know, everybody thinks they should just do whatever the fuck they want to do. Because that's what they did. That's the only way that, they, as we've mentioned so many times, the only way that indie outlaw talent gets over is by doing everything you're not supposed to do and being allowed to get away with it. Sometimes for the greater good, the fucking walk-on butler part should not steal the scene from Cary Grant. Anyway. The tag team title match was next, and Brian, last you gave me the best advice for this that I've ever had about anything. He said, <laughs> if you go into this match, because I talked to you before I saw it <clears throat> and, and, and you said, if you go into this match, just having in your mind to ignore the fact that there are rules or that there should be logic, you might like it. And I got to admit, they came as close to getting me to like them as they're probably ever gonna. Uh, the Bucks, that is, and Olivier. Olivier was really a, 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 he stayed out of the way of a lot of this. Um, the Bucks actually wrestled a little. They sold some. I, I loved the fact that the people were loving Adam Page and booing Kenny Olivier for being a fucking putz. The Bucks. They really booed the Bucks. I was surprised by well, that. It, and and let's face it, they were working. It's like the fucking audience for the question mark in Atlanta. They're working with them because they want to be part of the show. So they, you know, but the Bucks went with it, kind of, sort of. They they shouldn't have suddenly become full on eye gouging, ball kicking, fucking heels. But they kind of got a little cocky and went with it. That's to their credit. <clears throat> but yeah, the people just decided we're gonna like Adam Page and we're gonna we're gonna help do what you people haven't done, which is fucking get him over. And so he was over, and he did great shit. There was acrobatry everywhere, but it wasn't it wasn't as bad as the Bucks and the Lucha Brothers because the Lucha Brothers flip so fucking much that that's when you get so far that you can't tell who's given the move and who's taking the move. 
They just get so fucking far afield. Um, but this was because Paige ain't going to do that stuff. And Olivier is a full grown adult man. So that they actually, you could tell who was given the moves and who was taking the moves in this match. So I like that. They seemed all serious about it in their own way. They didn't wink and nod at people. It was a, like you said, it was a modern match that guys would appear and disappear for long periods, just if they weren't figured into whatever was supposed to be taking place. Uh, sometimes they'd tag and sometimes they wouldn't. And there was endless back and forth instead of heat, comeback, whatever. But as an athletic spectacle, it was exciting. And it was better than normal on everybody's part. Uh, you know, as, as far as the what they did. So, no, this didn't stink. And Paige went wild and beat everybody. So they finally got him up. Like I said, maybe the people, the fans see something in him that they see in themselves because he's an irresponsible drunk. I don't, or maybe it's just that he looks like of the of the four guys in the ring, he's the only one that might get a blowjob sometime in the immediate future. <laughs> they like that about him. I don't know. Anyway, um, yeah, this was the, this was the referee Uncle Creepy. This was yeah, the he, one. He's awful. Oh my God! Well, I mean, he's buried. He's buried deeper than fucking, you know, uh, the bottom of the well to begin with. Every time they have one of these tag matches, but he doesn't look like anybody or has the the body language or the assertion of anybody that you would listen to. He, he ain't Ref Aubrey. They don't put Ref Aubrey in those matches because I don't think they want to bury her. Because it would. Because what's she supposed to do? Just stand there and. <laughs> You know, but that's the thing. Sometimes there are rules. Sometimes there aren't rules. Sometimes you force the guy out of the ring who's not the legal guy. Yeah. Other times you just shrug and go, oh, just do everything. Yeah. And so as an athletic spectacle, as you know, as modern wrestling, this was very good. It had a lot of flaws that would prevent it from being considered a classic for fuck's sake, because of the fact that they didn't have to follow any of the rules, you know, when you follow the rules of the game, that's kind of what makes it hard, isn't it? Whether it's a work or not, isn't it that you have to get this certain thing accomplished within the framework of the actual rules that you were playing under? That's what makes it separates the really top talent from whoever the fuck, right? I, I believe that concept will be addressed in chapter five of the new Young Bucks memoir. Well, but I mean, for this crowd, they don't care. Because this crowd is not like a wrestling crowd. They have purely come to see train wrecks and bullshit comedy. And they get worked by Cody, Jericho, and MJF because they're the only ones in the company that know how to do it. And, and they get worked into liking actual real wrestling matches. But the crowd comes for bullshit, stupid comedy and train wreck video game wrestling matches. So they're giving them what they want, but... There's a ceiling on that, I'm just telling you. What did you think? Well, I think I told you when I gave you the warning I had to watch it that I actually thought it was the best Young Bucks match I'd ever seen. I think part of it was they were playing heel. It wasn't just moves. It was also a little bit of storytelling involved. I realized that if I look at all the Young Bucks matches I've seen, they're like the Road Warriors with flips. <laughs> that the the Matt Buck, I guess, he sells nothing. He pops up from everything. He has just unlimited power and recuperation skills. They're like the Road Warriors, just nonstop. Yeah. They never get hurt. They never stay down. They're always ready to keep going. I enjoy the Adam Page stuff. I enjoy the long tease, or I assume it's a long tease, with Adam Page and Omega. I mean, even at the end after the match where Adam Page wouldn't shake everyone's hand, and then he teased going for the buckshot lariat. And Omega turns around and then Adam Page just welcomes him to leave the ring with him. At this point, they, sh they shouldn't turn on each other. And everybody would be like, what, what the fuck? Yeah, keep it going. <laughs> you know what? It's the best stuff. You know, I got to say, I I'm not as high on Omega as a lot of other people. I've liked some of his stuff in the past. Other stuff I think is overrated. This is two matches in a row of his that I really liked. I enjoyed the 30-minute Iron Man with Pac. On I, I have not seen that yet. I'm going to try to zip through these things before the experience this week. I enjoyed that, and I really enjoyed it. Are you saying I can watch 30 minutes of him? Well, uh, 
I'm I'm not r- actually right now after seeing this show very interested in PAC, but we'll get to that in a minute. But should I I'll watch 30 minutes of Olivier? I thought it was a good match. You may not because you see things differently and you also see things with him specifically <laughs> differently, but I enjoyed it. I thought that was a great match. And I really, like I said, this is the best Young Bucks match I've ever seen. Um, there was storytelling to a degree that you don't normally see with them. It wasn't perfect. I, I agree. I agree. It wasn't perfect. It drives me crazy that there are no fucking rules. But, and it went a long time. And I think it took a lot of the energy out of the crowd. But, well, he, here's something else. Why was this match on so early? Because, it, it, for the flow of the thing, Guevara and Darby Allen go out there and do, like I said, five finishes and two hospitalization angles. Then we have almost 30 minutes of fucking tag team action like crazy with some of the top guys in the company. And then they followed it with poor Nyla Rose and Chris Stantlander for the women's title. Who the fuck envisioned that? And that match, I didn't like that match at all, and the crowd was dead silent. Well, you think uh, I wrote this follows that tag match question mark question mark and then immediately Excalibur says, "Well, Chris Statlander had fever and flu all week because she's not used to Earth's atmosphere." Yeah. So you ever you ever hear someone roll their eyes because you can hear it from Jim yeah. Ross every <laughs> week now when they talk about the galaxy she's from. I know, I uh, yeah, because I've heard Jim roll his eyes. Do you know? Uh, do you know why she crash landed on Long Island? I have no. I thought it was Area Fifty One. I think they said it was Long Island, actually. Okay, uh, because of the great pizza, obviously. Oh, for fuck's sake! Look, the point is, here's another, here's another problem we've got. Somebody needs to tell these talents, men, women, whatever. We like most of you, but we don't like all of you. And here's what we don't like: take it out. Her fucking outfit's fine. Her look is fine. Her name is fine. But I apparently she came up with, I'm from the Andromeda Galaxy, and I'm from an alien from, an out, from outer space, and somebody needs to say, no, not on this fucking television show you're not. But they don't, because they won't tell any of these outlaw fucking goofs what to do to help them. She has all kinds of potential. But also, she's a girl, she needs... An OVW or an NXT, regular quality training. You can't just come off the indies. They say she's been wrestling three years. Well, that used to mean, okay, that means uh, three times three. You've had almost a thousand matches. Now it may mean you've been wrestling three years. You've had 30 matches, whatever. You can't just come off the indies and go to this level with no help or production to, to, to help you not make mistakes like telling people you really are a fucking space alien or killing yourself and your opponent trying to do a top rope superplex when everything else in the goddamn match has not come off perfectly. Did you see that one where she almost drug old Nyla Rose down on her head and killed her too? I did see that, yeah. So this this match couldn't follow the tag match in, in under any circumstances. A girls match was... It, it, I don't know if if Charlotte and fucking Becky Lynch could have followed that tag match They'd have come a lot closer, but going from four guys doing all that shit down to two girls, and both of them are fairly green, Nyla Rose looked better than usual. I love that spear through the ropes deal. They took some nasty bumps on the ramp. They they were working hard. It was the wrong place on the card, and it went too long. And finally, Nyla Rose wins with a power bomb off the fucking turnbuckle. Even the girls, multiple fucking... The hospitalization finishes to bring and and this was a 20 minute segment too long in the wrong place and it, it, i hate to knock them because they worked hard but they weren't ready to do all of that in that spot and go uh, by the time you had your vtr pre-tape and your entrances and your match which was at least 15 minutes it was over a 20 minute fucking segment. Good. And this show was all right. How long did this thing time out to be from start to finish? I think it was like, well, I didn't watch the pre-show. I'm just going from the main show starting. I think it was like three and a half hours. 
Well, add an hour for me, and uh, but not quite. I'll get to that in a second. Anyway, what do you think of old Nyla and Chris? Was that your closing thoughts? I think the same thing I've said all along. I'm not taking anything away from potential, but I don't think AEW needed a women's division. They have too many people in this women's division who are not ready for a spot on a major league wrestling television show. The matches don't do it for me. I like women's wrestling when done right. I just think they did a women's division to have a women's division. And I don't see any reason why they did it, to be quite honest. They don't have enough talent to justify having a division. They just don't. (sighs) Well, they got so much talent, they can't feature them all on the two-hour program that they have every week where everybody gets to go 25 minutes. Yeah. Ay, ay, ay. Uh, well, we'll talk about that in a second, too. Anyway, thank goodness, next came the match we've all been waiting for, MJF and Cody. And thank goodness, because I was losing my patience a little bit again. MJF is a star from the time he walks out, his facials, his attitude, we know that, but what the fuck is on poor Cody's neck? <laughs> oh, I remember when... Brock Lesnar got that fucking tattoo of that awful goddamn thing. Was it the thing on his back or the thing on his chest he got first? I, it's either a dagger on his chest or some goddamn Harley Davidson bullshit on his back. And didn't tell him. He was here in OVW. Didn't tell anybody. And they saw it after the fact, obviously. And, oh, my God, we got memos. And that's where they put in the rule. No talent is to get a tattoo unless approved by the office. Because they're they're trying to sell the all-American boy NCAA champion from the University of Minnesota, and he looks like a goddamn fucking hell's angel with short hair. Um, But the, the product placement is suspect on that tattoo, don't you think? I have a lot of thoughts about it. I think it's the biggest mistake of Cody Rhodes's life. I think we could also call it Exhibit A in his upcoming divorce proceedings. <laughs> I think... His father had a splotch, and now he has a splotch. Oh, my God. I think he has a neck tattoo on his chest and a chest tattoo on his neck. I think whoever or his friends that didn't talk him out of that aren't really his friends. I think it's just a colossal mistake. They're about to put on an action figure. Doesn't have that stupid tattoo. He's an executive (laughs) vice president who wears a suit and represents the company, and now he has... I've heard a lot of people say it looks like a bad prison tattoo. Just what a, I mean, even if you wanted one there, the size of it, it took me out of the match in a lot of ways. And the color of it, the brightness of it all. What? I mean, you know what? (laughs) It's just, it makes me question any decision Cody Rhodes makes in the future. What a bad decision. Just what a stupid move. And I heard his wife did an interview where she said she wasn't happy about it. I'd like to know what Tony Khan thought about it. All of a sudden, his executive vice president shows up with a prison tattoo. I, I just, I don't know what the hell Cody Rhodes was thinking. What a, what a horrible, horrible idea that somehow went from his brain to fruition. <laughs> I, I don't understand. You know that, that big red spot that Dusty had on his side, right? Yeah. So in Mid-South, right? It was the, uh, was it the August? I think it was the August... Superdome. Uh, Superdome show in 84. Yeah. In 84, we get the word about five weeks out because we, you know, advertise the big dome shows, you know, way out. We're going to get to work in the Superdome in new Orleans. And one of the feature matches with dusty roads and junkyard dog. And I'm like, Oh my God, the fucking place is good. They're going to blow. This is going to be, we're going to start a riot. The inc- reaction is going to be incredible. Plus to that time, I had never met Dusty Rhodes in person. Never, I'd seen him work live before I got into business, but I'd never met him. And so I'm like, we get to work with, and this was when Dusty was one of the three, it was Dusty, Flair, and Andre, right? One of the three biggest names in the business. So, and I'm doing all the promos, and I'm really geared up for this. Of course, it's... As we later found out, that's when Dog left and it became Dusty Rhodes and Sonny King. And the fucking, the heat level when Dusty was in the ring in New Orleans was off the charts. When Sonny King tagged in, it cooled quite considerably. I've never been so disappointed. But anyway, 
one of the promos I did leading up to that was, let me tell you something, Dusty Rhodes, you're coming in here to Mid-South. This is our backyard. You may be a big star in the rest of the territory, but you know, or the rest of the world, but you know what you are to us. You're just a big fat guy. You know what that red spot is, Jim Ross, that red spot on his side? That's where he had the word Goodyear sanded off of him. <laughs> And then somebody afterwards said, hey, uh, you know Dusty? I said, no, I've never met him. He said, yeah. They said, you better hope he don't hear that promo. <laughs> and then that at the Dome that night, that's where inadvertently I first got over with him because they had done the deal. They'd taken my tennis racket away. It was a fine to carry the tennis racket. And Duggan's two before, they'd find, because Watts figured the Mid-South had to do something about the foreign objects, right? So I get around it for the Superdome by wearing a tuxedo and I've got a cane and I go to uh, the, the finishes. I'm going to roll in the ring while Dusty's going wild and the referee's distracted and I'm going to swing the cane at him. He's going to duck and hit me with the bionic elbow. And of course the locker rooms were separate. We still never met, right? We worked with him. I've never met him. And I told the referee, I think it was Carl Fergie. I said, please go over and tell Dusty that I'm going to swing at his head. So please duck. Cause I don't want to, you know, I'm thinking that I'm working with Dusty Rhodes and we knew he was the booker in the Carolinas. Right. So we're trying to get over with Dusty and Fergie says, I'll, I'll tell him. And some bitch when months later, when I actually ever ended, did end up speaking to Dusty Rhodes on the phone for the first time when, cause he had wanted us to come to the Carolinas. He says, so you're the kid that was going to knock out the American dream in the Superdome, eh? <laughs> he loved that shit because he'd, okay, and you know the way that the boys bumped for him, and, he, and then Flair had been coming in, seeing the matches with the rock and roll and pitching us to Jimmy Crockett. So we were made off of that. <clears throat> you know, that, that that's when they started wanting us in the Carolinas. But I don't know that he ever did hear about the fucking, I didn't bring the promo about having Goodyear sanded off of him up to him ever. I don't know if he heard that one. Well, you haven't given your thought. What did you think of the tattoo? Well, no, that's why I, I don't know what the fuck he's thinking for all the things you just said. I, I couldn't have said it better myself. It, eh, at least he's still having good matches. Um, I, th you know, I was so overwhelmed by that. It took me a second, but the band doing Cody's entrance was a nice touch, made him look bigger. He did have a lot of backup with his whole team coming out, but I, here's the thing again. I don't know why Brandy's at ringside. If this situation is so dangerous, MJF has been a thorn in his side and stabbed him in the back. Wardlow, this giant monster who almost killed him in the cage. I can understand Arn being there. I don't know why Brandy comes to ringside except to get on television. You know, that's, um, the, that's the one complaint I have about Cody matches. And I was thinking about it during this match. There's always, there's always smoke and mirrors. What I mean is there's always shit at ringside. There's always either Brandy and now Arn. There's always stuff happening that probably doesn't need to happen to make the match great. And in this match, it kind of, I, I thought uh, unnecessary is what I thought. Well, it, it 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 was a little cluttered. It was a little cluttered. after the entrance. They, most of the people went back, but anyway, they perfectly they knew what they were doing with this because the people, it, the girls' match had kind of settled everybody down, but they didn't start out too hot because then it would have looked like every other match. Every other match so far had jump started and just started at hundred miles an hour. So they ring the bell. They tell, and MJF keeps taking a powder. And he knocked the fucking fat guy's hat off and he tossed the beer on the other one. He's fucking great. Um, and it, what Cody did, MJF sold everything perfectly because he took, he took the heel getting his ass kicked bumps rather than the bumps they teach you in wrestling school. Did you see the difference? It, 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 he bumps differently and with personality for each move that Cody does instead of just everything looking the same. Um, they did different shit in this match than in all the other matches. Different moves, different pace. MJF took fewer bumps in this thing and meant more than anybody else's on the show. He got pops e equivalent to the fucking table crash for just getting his fucking ass handed to him in a normal way. Cody's dive onto Wardlow got a huge fucking pop. 
when he uh, tried to prevent Wardlow from, and that's another that Brandy has to do the cross body and at least they're not having Wardlow sell, but still she throws the beer on him and he, and then Arn backs him up and then she cross bodies him and he catches her, blah, blah, blah. But I wasn't crazy about all that still. Nevertheless, um, I like the fact that they took their time and they had a pace with this and they worked holes and they told a story and Cody had been slightly selling the toe from the start of the match. And with the toe broke being broken in the cage match, the news was already out. So then finally, when fucking MJF gets advantage and takes his fucking boot off and bites the toe, he's biting the fucking guy's toe. And the people are reacting like he's fucking taking a chainsaw to him. Cause they were into it and they understood what was going on. Um, I missed how MJF got his juice. He got good juice, but how did it happen? They never, well, I know how it happened, but how did it nominally happen? They never showed it or explained it. I, I thought the same thing. I was like, what caused the juice? By the way, I also thought, is it real juice? Oh, uh, it, it looked pretty good. I think you would have a hard time you know, keeping fake, I hate to say the word fake blood, but I'll say it fake blood on your head for that long for the rest of the match. But also because it didn't stain and discolor him after, even after being wiped off like that fake shit usually does. But, but I, I thought that just because he probably, I'm not trying to knock MJF here, but he's probably not an experienced swordsman and figured somebody's going to see me unless I just go down and do it under the ring. <laughs> because I did that a couple of times, first couple of times, you know, because I, you, you know, I was always freaked out about that. Uh, but you don't think it was a gimmick, do you? I thought it looked pretty good. I've never seen gimmick blood look that, that good. I don't know. Uh, like I say, just popped up with the blood. That that was kind of well. That that was my explanation for it. Was we'll go down and maybe they won't fucking realize. But I'm going to go underneath and do it so I'm not. I don't have eyes on me while there's. But you can create other distractions, which they were anyway with Cody and the other stuff. But anyway, um, the the vertical suplex over the top rope to the floor. The Dynamite Kid Tiger Mask spot, that was fucking phenomenal. It was very well done, both athletically and also at the right time, and safer than most of the things these guys do, but still got the same kind of fucking pop. But these guys just know what the fuck they're doing. Um, Because I, I wrote here, they weren't just doing this stuff, they were building to it, paying it off, and selling it afterwards with no obvious cooperation. <laughs> they went in the, the good one, two, even though they started doing forearms. I hate that, but it, it, for the one, two with body language, they weren't just punching each other and nothing below the neck was registering it. The wobbly legs and the fucking stagger. And then the, the people came apart when Cody finally took that belt off and whipped MJF. And then pleaded with Paul Turner, one more, and Turner turns his back. If you're going to fucking do something with the referee that's shady in terms of realism or not, that's the kind of thing to do. Because Cody, after all he's been through, and he did get whipped on national TV, and he's sympathetic, and he asked the referee just one more time, and the referee turns his back there, boom, whack, boom, and okay. That's the kind of thing you can play with in a top match with top guys who do it right. And also, did you hear the wax? Because how wide that belt is. Yeah. See what I mean? Anyway, MJF crawling to Cody and begging, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it. This is classic. He's getting the shit kicked out of him. He's bleeding. He's crawling and fucking begging. And then when he thinks he's got the fucking Cody distracted or whatever, he spits in his face and goes to get the ring and the camera missed the ring fucking pull out. Did you see that? Or not see that as the case may be. Yeah. And in general, I don't know if this is the place to say it, but there's too many shots of fans in the crowd at the wrong time. Yeah. When there's stuff happening in the ring, they show some fan just randomly and making an oh shit face. Oh my God. I can't believe that happened. Yeah. Well, I'd like to see more of what's happening. 
you know, afterwards, after the reaction, after a big finish or whatever. Yes, but in the middle of the match, you're you're playing with fucking fire. Anyway, he turned around and got the ring. We saw it on the replay, but we didn't see it live. But I've obviously, when he hit the punch, I knew what he was going for, or when he swung the punch, rather, he swings, Cody ducks it, hits a crossroads, won't pin him, grabs him, hits another one, won't pin him. This is, I could have sworn, I would have put money that Cody was going to win this match and then MJF was going to get heat after. But son of a bitch, Cody went the other way, and that's what, now, honestly, that's what Dusty would have done. He would have won and then got heat after on him. But Cody went the other way, and this worked, and it did more for MJF, and it's prolonging this thing. But the way that he ducked the one shot with the ring, hit the two finishes, could have beat him, but he didn't because he wanted to hurt him more, and then MJF gets the fucking lucky shot and falls pretty much un unconscious on top of Cody, one, two, three. That was fucking great. And the people in the building got it. And then the people at home got it when we saw the replay. And, of course, the announcers said, oh, he's got the ring, because the announcers didn't see it, because the announcers are watching their monitor. So they didn't call it at first. But otherwise than that, which was neither of these guys' fault, that was my favorite match of the night. That was fucking... It, it, and once again, when wrestling matches break out on this show, it stands out so much that I like them even more, but that was fucking perfect to me. I thought Cody sold the ring shot fantastically. He just went yeah. right down. It was perfect. And that's the way you get it over. Imagine if, if the other guys are getting run over by fucking Volkswagens and being battered by jackhammers, and this guy gets punched by a guy with a ring on and fucking goes down and gets sympathy for it. It's, it's not that hard to figure out, but nobody will look at it. You know, when you hear people say that wrestling's evolved and it's changed and everyone has to change with the times, I see people like MJF, The Revival, and the WWE, great example, guys who do things the way I miss guys doing it. The guys who do things the way I think you can do it and get over it nowadays, and they do, it gives me some hope. MJF is so good, considering his age. He's just so good. And, um, well. And I'll tell you one thing, that Cody neck tattoo, if they ever wanted to find a way to make Brandy a sympathetic baby face, knowing she has to go home and look at that, ah. that definitely made me feel bad. Hey, man, maybe maybe he can come back with MJF and a loser loses their tattoo or MJF's hair versus Cody's tattoo and they can have it derma brazed or you whatever. You know, I remember years ago getting upset when all of a sudden Triple H showed up on Raw bald or, you know, at least with a crew cut. Yeah. And I'm thinking, why not do a hair match? You've had your long hair for years. It would mean so much if someone got in there, held you down, of and course. cut your hair, building up to something. Same thing with this. I saw that tattoo. I'm like, man, if you're going to get an ugly ass, horribly placed tattoo like that, make it a gimmick. If I beat you, you have to get a <laughs> tattoo on your neck. And by the way, you'll notice that, that they thought that up there, hair match is just too wrestling until Vince and fucking President Pig shit had one and drew the biggest buy rate in history of buy rates. Anyway, remember what I said about I, schizophrenic. I don't know who I'm dealing with here. Is it Dr. Jekyll or Mr. Hyde? We have gone from a very good tag match for the tag team title to a very long match for the women's title to a, the best match of the night grudge match between MJF and Cody. And what do they put on after that? Pack and orange Cassidy, my little dog pockets makes pay-per-view. I said, all right, I'm going to watch this because everybody has said, Oh, well, we ought, you ought to see, uh, you know, when orange Cassidy actually has a match and he gets going, he can do stuff. So I gave him this opportunity to show me that. I will preface this. <laughs> Remember when I, I said, it, 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 here's another thing. Orange Cassidy appeared just like last year, right? Like I was talking about Jimmy Del Rey. It was great when you could take a guy nobody had seen and, you know, but he was an experienced veteran. Well, I, this that'll be the only way I ever compare my little dog pockets to Jimmy Del Rey. But... I wondered where the fuck did this guy even come from? I haven't heard this name. Apparently he was one of the fucking Chikara gang for the people who don't know what Chikara is. Chikara still a thing. I hope not. Hopefully it's not still a thing. I actually don't even know. Well, for people who don't know, 
in Pennsylvania, what town were they based out of? A little town in Pennsylvania. Anyway, Chikara was this little independent wrestling promotion where all the guys in it pretended to be luchadors. They all dressed up in masks and outfits, but they didn't give themselves Hispanic names. There was a crew of ants, a green ant and a red ant and a fire ant, and there's a, you know different animals. Basically, the, the early patient zero of cosplay bullshit wrestling, right? And they had somewhat of a following in the Northeast area where they would draw four or 500 people to their fucking shows. And I'd heard about this, and I felt about it as you can imagine. But then when Ring of Honor first was bought by Sinclair and we're running tapings in Baltimore, <clears throat> I believe one year we did eight different tapings and they're trying to draw some people. And Delirious, Hunter Johnston, had been working for them. And he knew the guys. And he said, well, we could have a Chikara match on TV and on some of these house shows, we'd maybe get a few of their fans in the Northeast and maybe it'd just be something different. All right. Cause I always liked Hunter and I always liked working with him. And on many of these things, okay. Can they just do the action athleticism of Lucha and not the fucking ha ha and bullshit? Cause he, cause he knew this was not what we were doing on the program. And he said, yes, I will explain. I'll explain this to them. So at one of our TV tapings in Baltimore, we have a six-man tag with whoever guys that they sent that was best representative of what they were doing, right? Unfortunately. And they had, let's say, seven or eight minutes, which was longer than we gave any match except for a, a main event on TV because we had a one-hour TV show. That's 45 seconds for each team's entrance, a 30-second pitch afterwards. You got six minutes bell to bell. Let's see some action. I don't care who wins. <clears throat> they spent the first three and a half minutes of their match doing some kind of grab ass spot where they were, it, it would end up, they'd hop over and duck under and grab the other guy's ass. Like they were Adrian street. And I'm, I'm in the truck going, what the fuck are they doing? And poor delirious is, has got his head in his hands. He's like, I told him. And then they started doing their shit. Well, since I forgot the fact that they'd never done television before, so a cue meant nothing to them because they were straight off the fucking indies. So when they got their cue, they took three or four minutes to fucking go home. So then, to everyone's consternation, including Mark Davis, the head editor, and Chris Resnick, who had just come on with us at the time, and myself, we had to fucking figure out a way to cut like three or four minutes of this grab-ass bullshit out of the television program and make it fit the fucking time or whatever. And that was the end of the Chikara experiment. But And when I saw them in the locker room, it was the same thing as the Super Smash Brothers. It was a bunch of nondescript, slightly built white guys that looked like they worked at a kiosk at the fucking mall that made these outfits and these outrageous names and characters so they could go play fucking wrestling. And Orange Cassidy, my little dog Pockets, apparently was one of these people in a previous incarnation. So now I know how he just suddenly appeared, but yet he's still so fucking bad. He's had so much experience at being bad. <laughs> and as I said before, these people come to see car crash, video game matches, and bullshit comedy, and they accidentally get worked by Cody and MJF and Jericho into like an actual wrestling because those guys are that good. But this is uh, an example of their fans and their company at its worst. And poor Pac, a supposed badass, the bastard, with that jacked up physique and that fucking stringy hair and that mean face has to put up with this. There they are face to face and orange Cassidy is doing the fake shin kicks. And then Pac did it too. While the people chant, this is awesome. The guy hits the ropes with his hands in his pockets. And Pac takes a bump for this shit. Then suddenly Pac turns around and gets heat on pockets like it matters at this point. 
He's beating the shit out of him. He's not. He's taking his time, kind of, so he wouldn't have to do too much to this fucking idiot without just beating him or knocking him out. Oh, that he let him kick out of a sit-out fucking power bomb. Tony Schiavone is pretending at this point that he likes this fucking moron, or else why is he just? He took thirty years away from wrestling and finally decided, well, fuck it, I don't care. This this match brought up to me the old joke that used to go around in the locker room. When a top guy or the booker would come up to one of the underneath guys or some job guy that was just the shits and go, how in the world can I beat you without hurting myself? Meaning, how can I have a match with you and even win and still not come out looking worse than I did going into it? Because you're so bad. That is what they did with Pac here. Pack then gives Orange Cassidy a top rope superplex and picks him up without pinning him. And he's going to jump off the top rope again, but Orange Cassidy keeps just rolling. He rolls out of the ring on one side. So Pack throws him back in, and he rolls out of the ring on the other side. And then suddenly, after he's had the shit kicked out of him by this bastard, after he's taken all these moves, after he has not tried in the beginning to even fight this fucking guy, which is the point of why this whole thing is fucking stupid, suddenly he goes from zero to hero and makes a big-ass comeback and is bumping pack all over the fucking ring. A fucking skinny goof wearing jeans and tennis shoes is kicking the shit out of a guy that didn't even try to begin with in this match is now kicking the shit out of pack pack stops him again after all this pockets puts his hands back in his pockets and makes another comeback and bumps pack all over the fucking ring again whereas upon then the lucha brothers come out and attack the best friends, a.k.a. the AGD, the ambiguously gay duo of Chuck Taylor and fucking Trent No Last Name, for no apparent reason, they have not interfered in this match. They've done nothing but stand out there since the start of it. Suddenly, the Lucha Brothers come out and do some fancy moves on the ramp to these guys as a distraction for Orange Cassidy so Pac can come up from behind him and tap him out. Pac needed a distraction to tap this fucking moron out. Pac is dead. This was a joke. It killed the show for me. After Cody and MJF, they do this shit? How can you take Pac seriously again ever against a top guy when he needs 10 minutes and help to beat a guy that wasn't even not only taking him seriously, but the fucking match in general seriously. I'll answer that question. It's all fake bullshit, and they're not going to pretend it's not. There is no explicable reason for a human being to act the way Pockets does in this situation unless it is phony and all for bullshit entertainment and comedy. Therefore, it is phony bullshit comedy. It buries the announcers who have to call it or try to call it or keep from calling it. It buries the opponent who has to go along with it. And it makes the business look fucking stupid. And just because these fucking all petite wrestling fans, these mealy mouth, little neck bearded basement dwelling, whatever the fucking other descriptions are that are used to describe these people, I just call them stupid. For whatever reason that they like that shit, that's exactly the reason why professional wrestling is dead and will never be taken seriously again. And I don't care whether there's a bunch of people in that building too, as I've mentioned before. Not only does Nambla get over with that audience, but if it became a thing that everybody should suddenly start picking dog shit up off the sidewalk and eating it, I would still not be eating the dog shit, even if I was the only one. And a real professional would refuse to take part in any of this around this fucking guy. But since nobody gives a shit anymore and they've just given up on the fact that fucking wrestling is gone and who gives a shit now, doesn't excuse it. So at that point in this program, 
after I saw the display that was Orange Cassidy allegedly really turning it on and going, I hit stop on the program and I hit delete on the recording. And that's the last bit of this pay-per-view that I saw or ever will see. There you have that. Fuck you, you fucking prick, you piece of shit. I would love, I would love to see you fucking hang your one of your feet on that dive with your pockets and go straight down to the goddamn concrete. And it, it, I don't know whether I'd rather see his neck fucking go sideways in three different directions or just see his brains explode on the fucking concrete. But that is just the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen there. And they still have not even bothered to give the announcers any reason to explain why this human being would act. just, he doesn't care. He's the king of sloth style. He doesn't care when he's in a fight with a fucking guy that's trying to kick his ass. He doesn't care because it's phony and it's bullshit. Fuck you and fuck your hands in your fucking pockets twiddling with your tiny little penis and your microscopic little balls. So that's the end of that show. Well, I assume they had a title match, they certainly but I did. didn't see it. Well, since you didn't watch it, what are your thoughts? And we kind of talked about this idea a few weeks ago on one of these shows, what are your thoughts on the idea that they did a title switch? They took the title off yes. Jericho and put it on Moxley. Well, and somebody tweeted the Fozzie summer tour schedule or whatever. So I guess that's why I, it's crazy. And that's nothing even against Moxley, but just no, he's a, what has he had it? Three months, six months. How long has it been? It ain't been long enough, but I guess he's going on tour with have him send in live remotes of interviews on television while he's on tour with Fozzie. I'm sure he can get the pay-per-view off in three months or whatever. If that was the reason, it was fucking crazy. But any reason is crazy to take the belt off Jericho right now, regardless of who it's going to be put on. So that was, I, I don't fucking know. Don't know and don't care. Because here's the thing. I'm sure I probably would have liked the match with Jericho and Moxley, if they didn't use thumbtacks or let Moxley go too far out of bounds, but because the previous segment was so offensive to me as a wrestling fan, I chose not to watch it. And I'm sure I've, well, I'm, I'm probably alone because anybody else at that point, they bought it. They said, fuck it. But I was considering my mental health rather than I, I just wrote that expense off as a goddamn loss. But fuck them. If they want me to watch their good shit, don't put shit that's so bad on right in front of it that I get disgusted with the whole thing and turn it off. That's a fucking lesson. Okay. And that was AEW revolution. Yeah. Maybe next time they have a fucking world championship match. They won't put goddamn cheetah, the chimpanzee on to do fucking flips and stink the joint out and fling poo at everybody first. And I'll see it. Well, the big question is where do we go from here on this show? <laughs> <laughs> How about a question or two, and then we'll bid you all a, a, a fond good day. Maybe a song? Possibly a song. Do we have songs? We have some songs. Well, let me get a question or two. A question and then a song. This first one was sent in the corny. And then, hey, how about a how about a song that is a question? Who are you? Who 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 who? Who the fuck are you? It's amazing they got fuck on the air in whatever seventy eight when they put out that record. <laughs> yeah, because it, it, nobody listened. Hey, I, I, Kiss did uh, 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 "Unholy," right? The song "Unholy," and I used that song to do a hype video for the first match between The Undertaker and Unibom, who later became Kane, obviously, in the Knoxville Civic Coliseum at the Super Bowl of Wrestling Show in 95, right? And I loved that video. It came out really good because I got all the WWF footage of Taker and I put it together with our stuff from Unibom, unholy, blah, blah, blah. I get a call. I'm up here in Louisville for three days. I get a chance three days to come and spend a few days at home. And then I'm going to go back down for our big first week of August, including the Super Bowl show. I get a call from Phil Rainey, the program director at channel 43 in Knoxville on Friday. Um, no, I, I tell a lie. It was, uh, well, I can't remember what day away. It was imminent that our last television, maybe it was Thursday, but our last television program, to go home for the Super Bowl show with this video in it was going to air that Sunday morning on, on Channel 43. 
And uh, Phil Rennie goes, well, I can't air the program. I said, well, what's the matter? Was the tape okay? No, I didn't. You've got this video, and he had that voice. And Phil Rainey, I wanted to like him because of his days with Les and doing Southeastern wrestling, but he was the most gutless yes man for this fucking prick station manager named Bill DeWert. If Phil had worked at WBR, Channel 10, the big sh- station in town, and he'd had a long career, but now he's the program director of the fourth and final station in Knoxville at the time, the Fox affiliate, with this... 30-something-year-old prick from out of town It was an asshole It was the station manager and wouldn't let the program director do anything. And Phil was just a yes man by that point. And he goes, I can't hear the program. What, is the tape okay? Well, no, it's uh, this video in it. What's the matter with the video? Well, there's a line where apparently there's a line that says, uh, blah, 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 you serve bastards and whores. You're unholy. Well, I hadn't, I'd done the video and it didn't even register with me, right? So I said, what the fuck? He said, well, we can't air the program. I said, it's for one fucking line. Bleep it. Well, I didn't want to alter the program without your okay. I said, goddamn, Phil, you're going to not air the go-home show to the Super Bowl of Wrestling that's going to do a five or six local rating instead of just putting bleep over bastards and whores in 10 seconds of a fucking video? So they bleeped it. But that brought that up to my mind. Gray Slick said motherfucker on Dick Cavett in 69, and no one no one realized it. <laughs> That's because nobody knew what Gray Slick was talking about anyway. The line was up against the wall, motherfucker, and she just sang it right on the air. But anyway, this question sent in the corny drive through at gmail.com from Eric Serrano. What are your thoughts on Triple H's comments on Batista's training prior to WWE? He referred to him being trained to be a 1970s big guy in his early days on the main roster. Did WWE ever complain to you about the way OVW was training talent? Oh, Laurinaitis would complain constantly about something, uh, but uh, it didn't do him any good. And with Batista, he wasn't trained to be a 70s big man. He was trained to be an 80s big man. Because if it was the 70s, we wouldn't let him do uh, as much as he did. Uh, But uh, we've told that story before. You know, you get a guy that's almost 30, he's never been a wrestling fan, not a natural, had had almost no training whatsoever, was injury prone, and not an assertive personality, but looked like that. What are you going to do with him? You're going to make him a gimmick? You're going to point him toward opponents like Big Show, Undertaker, and Kane? And you're going to hope that you can get a five-year run, steal some pay-per-view main events out of him, and then he'll go on to lead a life of religious fulfillment somewhere. (laughs) And that's pretty much what happened, except that they stripped him of the gimmick and were almost going to fire him until he started working out with Triple H. And then they remade him as the Beast. Uh, and you know, he, well, he, he was awful pussy whipped when he was here in Louisville. Cause he was married and his wife told him everything to do. And he just sat in the corner and fucking put his hoodie up and shivered a lot. Cause he was always cold and he was very, he was a frail demon and he was very self-conscious and didn't want to go out and do shit. Right. I put, when I put him in the ring with Kane at one of Les Thatcher shows up at the casino in Indiana. I sat him down. I said, well, tell him what you do. Oh, I'll do anything you want me to do. I said, tell him what you do. He's here to try to get your shit over. And, and Glenn had to drag it out of him. Uh, but then he got the big head when he started making the money and was the best friends with the son-in-law and decided then, oh, now I'm a big star. And he came out of his shell. Uh, but we we did the math and we had somebody track it down in his actual WWE career minus injury time worked out to something like 62 months or about the five years or maybe it was 48 months. It was, or 58 months rather. It was somewhere right under or right over five years that I predicted. If you took out the time that he was out with injuries, because did I mention he was injury prone? He had great athleticism and a great look. So you give him a gimmick and you try to let the experienced talent uh, fucking draw some money with him without him having to be a polished worker, which he never became because he didn't have time. And now he's in the movies. So who gives a shit? But they, to me, missed 
an opportunity by having to tear him down and rebuild him from scratch when they first got him when he was already built. One more question here this week, Jim. This was sent into Courtney Drive through at gmail.com from Joe in Albany, New York. I wanted to know what you thought about them putting the belt on Goldberg and having him beat Bray Wyatt. Boy, and people didn't like that a lot, did they? Um, you know, it's just Vince is going back to the stars that that he knows or that he created, or in this case, that he, you know, hired away and fumbled the first couple of times. 20 years later, he's, you know, people don't remember the WWF run. They remember him from WCW, Goldberg. But there comes a point. You know, I didn't bring Bob Armstrong in and make him the Smoky Mountain heavyweight champion, even though he was at that point still a better promo and a better worker than anybody else that could have taken it. I made him the special attraction, the commissioner, the guy who had to come out of retirement for the big matches, but not a steady presence in the ring or elsewise it would you couldn't let anybody else get over <clears throat> same reason that kevin sullivan told me eddie graham used to call vince senior up and say hey, can you can you give dusty some dates for a run up there because i got to get somebody else in florida over and nobody gets over with dusty around lawler had to leave memphis every so often so somebody else could get a chance because nobody was going to get over lawler in memphis as long as he was there <clears throat> It, you know, it's the same thing. At this point, he's not going to work long matches. He's not going to work a regular schedule. Bring the legends back as attractions in their standalone matches, but do not involve them in the title picture because then everybody just sees how shitty your current talent is or looks or appears to be or sounds because of the bad booking and the rotten presentation and the fact that most current talent don't look like grown fucking adult ass kicking men anymore. <laughs> Which is why I had that problem that one time they did the Raw 10 years ago or whatever, and they had the Miz standing in the ring with Stone Cold Steve Austin and The Rock. And the only thing you have to think that most of the lapsed fan had to say was, who is this small child standing in the ring with Stone Cold and The Rock? When you had guys who looked like that and who got over like that and were allowed to get over like that and who people have seen bleed and fight and fucking all this shit, and you put them in the ring with these silly, contrived, staged gimmicks, outrageous costumes, and fucking guys that do scripted fucking promos fed to them by writers and don't connect with anybody because it ain't real, who comes off looking like shit? Your new talent. Am I wrong? Am I even slightly right? <laughs> Maybe slightly right, yeah. But I mean, seriously, it, 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 at some point, you've got to try to make your new guys, and 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 you know that's that's what OVW and NXT was all about. But now NXT has become a better promotion and a better television program. And at least with fresher and and more exciting talent than the guys on the big programs are either are or are allowed to be. Maybe they're all so bored they don't give a shit. Maybe it's just how they're produced, what they're told to do. Maybe all of the above. I don't know. But it's it's just it's ass backwards. And if I was the young guys, I'd want to stay as far away from the main roster as possible, which I understand a lot of them do, because that way they won't get fed to Goldberg. Or to Brock or whatever. But somebody said Brock squashed Ricochet here recently, right? Well, what the fuck do you think was going to happen? That, that would be insane for anything else to happen. But you have to somehow find some people that can challenge the Brocks and the Goldbergs realistically and in people's minds and in in their hearts as well instead of these small children reading recited choreographed scripted material and doing choreographed scripted angles and matches nobody believes them okay well before we get to a song or two this is probably a good point to mention the new patreon is up that's true if you'd like to be a patron of patreon patreon.com slash cornet 
The <laughs> archive tier is up. For $5 a month, to get access to the archives. We're going to be uploading more and more shows. Right now, there's an entire batch of the first several episodes of The Experience and the first several episodes of The drive Through here. How far this show has come from those early days. As oh, well, you're just mad because you wasn't on it back then. Oh, I just listened to him. Not mad about that at all. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm mad that you weren't on it back then. <laughs> I'll tell you that. But. Also, we have right now three different compilations of Jim Cornette swearing, cursing, and insulting everyone from various episodes. One's nine minutes. I think one's 11 minutes and one maybe 13 minutes. Join too right hot, now. Too hot for YouTube. Too hot for YouTube, certainly. Patreon.com slash Cornette. We're going to have more of the archives going up all the time, as well as more tears coming later this month. Join now as so oh, wait many a minute of you now. already have. Hold on. What's that? Don't say that. Let's go for the first part of April because the whole March is a little busy for me. That's why we're putting up these shows. We're going to add new shows every week, right? And that's why it's a basic tier for a basic price because we don't want to promise anything we can't deliver. And then we're going to start branching out after I finish with my busy March into some more recording exclusively for all the patrons of Patreon. You heard it here. Breaking news. <laughs> more tears, more bonus content, maybe even more drive through coming in April. Patreon.com slash Cornette. Join now and access the archives. Well, with that, the drive through is closed. I think it's about time. Remember, you can follow Jim on Twitter at the Jim Cornette. You can follow me on Twitter at Great Brian Last. You can hear me on the 605 Super Podcast at 605pod.com or available wherever it is that you find your favorite podcasts. Don't forget, the Jim Cornette Experience debuts, the newest episode debuts this Friday, available wherever you find your favorite podcast or on YouTube, tinyurl.com slash official corny YouTube, or just go to YouTube and search for Jim Cornette for full episodes of the drive through the experience, clips from various shows, omnibus collections, all with the exclusive Travis Heckle artwork, which gets better and better. There's one he did of you as Michael Jackson. That is stunning. People need to see this. Go to YouTube. Was, was it was it was it was it eighties era Michael Jackson or modern era Michael Jackson? I want to know what color I was. Well, <laughs> it was eighty era Michael Jackson. Did however, you, you were. Did white. you see? Did you in that hot tub time machine part four thing or whatever? The guy's freaking out because he's seeing the Walkman. He's seeing all these eighties stuff, but he doesn't know what's going on. And finally, he grabs somebody, stops him on the street, and says, "Quick, what color is Michael Jackson?" And they said, <laughs> "Black." He's like, no! <laughs> I had not seen that. <laughs> it's a it's a time, uh, a, a time, a generation of an era. Also, you... once again, a reminder, patreon.com slash cornet. Get access to the archives. We're going back to 2013, the beginning of the experience and the drive-thru. Here are those early episodes today, patreon.com slash cornet. Don't forget Cornette's collectibles at jimcornette.com. Action figures, burger towels, t-shirts, autograph photos, DVDs, books, and so much more. Anything you'd like to add here? Yes. Send me some money, motherfuckers. It's a lot nicer than it was last time. Jim Cornette. Well, I'm in a better mood. Jimcornette.com. This show has been sponsored by the Law Office of Stephen P. New, 888-692-8084. Get even with Stephen by visiting newlawoffice.com. But until this fucking wrap up is almost as long as the wrap up was on the pre show when the announcers had to fill five minutes because they're poor at time management. Hear us this Friday on the experience. And again, next week, back on its regular Monday release schedule for the drive through for Jim Cornette. I'm the great Brian Last. Tally ho! Finally.